preface of the private soldier under washington this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by david wales the private soldier under washington by charles knowles bolton preface much has been written about the american revolution but our knowledge of the private soldier of the patriot army is confined chiefly to washington's description of their sufferings at valley forge their story is to be found in a line here and there scattered through the mass of contemporary literature in sifting this material it has seemed best to give in every case the name of the authority who saw what he described no student however would willingly forget the labours of those later writers who have done so much to make easier the way for others i record with pleasure my obligation to professor edward channing of harvard college for very many valuable suggestions and also to mr albert matthews whose knowledge of the language and customs of the period has been of great service to me c k b pound hill shirley massachusetts july nineteen o two end of preface chapter one of the private soldier under washington by charles knowles bolton this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter one the origin of the army when the colonists in america rose in rebellion against the english government in seventeen seventy five they occupied scarcely more territory than had been won from the wilderness a century earlier pioneers from the shores of the north sea had crossed the atlantic to make for themselves homes the more venturesome had forced their way to the headwaters of the coast rivers to build blockhouses for trade and defence little by little they and their descendants cut away the timber along the banks of many pleasant streams and planted grain and now at the southward their lands reached from the ocean to the appalachian range the watershed of the potomac the james the roanoke the santee the savannah and the altamaha river farther north they cleared and tilled the country which is drained by the susquehanna the hudson the connecticut the kennebec and the penobscot here was a theatre of war with great possibilities for the strategist who knew the topography thoroughly and could marshal the rivers and hills like forces in reserve to checkmate his antagonist throughout washington's campaigns near new york the hudson river on the east and the delaware on the west served to keep the british in check the manoeuvres of gates and green in the carolinas were everywhere influenced by the broad streams that crossed the country but rivers were dangerous allies and when made part of a great plan might by the fortunes of war prove ruinous to any army in the campaign of seventeen seventy seven burgoyne was to gain control of the hudson in order to separate the men of new england from their brothers in rebellion but he accepted a position within the bend of the river at saratoga and was compelled to surrender in the expedition of cornwallis in seventeen eighty one the converging streams of the york and the james which were to protect his army held him like a trap as soon as the french allies came into possession of the sea the political divisions show that england laid claim to the eastern part of america with the exception of florida massachusetts still included the territory between the western part of nova scotia now called new brunswick and new hampshire later known as maine and the land between the connecticut river and lake champlain afterward the state of vermont was at this time within the bounds of new york the rich country between the upper mississippi and its tributary the ohio had but recently been added to the government of quebec there were few english inhabitants in this region and the french stockades and trading villages such as detroit vincennes on the wabash and kaskaskia were important only as settlements along the water highway from canada and the great lakes to new orleans the southern english colonies already looked westward to the mississippi for their expansion beyond all this region lay the untouched forests which gathered rains for the far-reaching waters of the rio grande the colorado the arkansas and the missouri the possessions of spain 
the english colonies in seventeen seventy five had a population of two and a half million people less than a third the number then in great britain and ireland moreover above half a million of these people were negroes barred very generally from military service many others refused from their religious views to bear arms and a considerable minority of the citizens more than a third of the men of influence said adams opposed an appeal to force it was fortunate for america that the war began in new england which had few tories and slaves and was able by furnishing a large part of the patriot army to show a strong front to the enemy earlier in the century there had been little to draw together the various races then settled upon the continent isolated as they were by religious differences social distinctions and the imperfect means of travel but a steady policy of irrigation and repression on the part of the english government quickened the sympathies of the people and led to the perfection of intercommunication and to the dissemination of political ideas the arbitrary restriction of trade and abrogation of privileges by an unseen power three thousand miles away aroused the colonies to a sense of their common danger the presence of an english garrison at boston and the enforcement of acts designed by parliament to crush out the revolutionary spirit in massachusetts made the colony a centre of the coming storm the members of a convention of delegates from the towns and districts in suffolk county meeting in september seventeen seventy four declared in language vigorous if a little florid that to arrest the hand about to ransack their pockets to disarm the parricide who stood with a dagger at their bosoms and to resist the usurpation of unconstitutional power would roll their reputation upon a torrent of panegyric to the abyss of eternity with their future fame secured they set about frankly to prepare for the conflict calling upon the people to elect their militia officers and acquaint themselves with the art of war that king george might not make an easy prey of a numerous brave and hardy people the action taken by several of the towns about boston was if possible more marked brookline for example appointed a committee in september to examine into the state of the town as to its military preparation for war in case of a sudden attack from our enemies on october twenty sixth seventeen seventy four the provincial congress sitting at cambridge chose a committee of safety with power to collect military stores and if necessary to summon and support the militia with the delegation of this authority to a specific body of leaders the opposition to great britain ceased to be wholly legislative for the committee had the necessary power to maintain armed rebellion the military measures of this period proposed in convention and carried by vote in time of peace and within three or four miles of the british garrison were a test of new england courage and determination that deserve recognition at the same time a plan of organization for the militia was outlined field officers were ordered to enlist if possible a quarter of the total number of militiamen for emergency service under the direction of the committee of safety these companies were to consist of at least fifty minute-men each and were to elect their own company officers twenty years earlier alarmist companies had been organized to repel the indians they may be considered as survivals of the regiments that were in king philip's time ordered to be ready to march at a moment's warning and these in turn can be traced to the companies of thirty men from each hundred of the militia which in sixteen forty five were to be prepared at half an hour's warning thus had the training in arms and in preparation against surprise and attack been handed down from the days of miles standish and simon willard the committee on the state of the province drew up december tenth seventeen seventy four an address to the people which urged the towns and districts to pay their local militia for their services in order to encourage them to obtain the skill of complete soldiers these preparations were well known in boston and lord percy who was for a time in command of the british troops there referred often to them in letters to his father as early as september twelfth he said that the rebels did not make a despicable appearance as soldiers he knew that training day had ceased to be a perfunctory ceremony 
the provincial congress resolved on april eighth seventeen seventy five that an army should be raised and established and other new england colonies should be asked to furnish their quotas of men for the general defence the records of the committees of safety and supplies show that various stores were being collected at this time such as spades pickaxes and bill hooks iron pots and wooden mess bowls carpenter's tools cartridge paper powder and fuses grape and round shot bombs mortars musket balls and flints molasses salt fish raisins oatmeal and flour from the eighth of march to the fourteenth of april seventeen seventy five sundry persons under the direction of john goddard were carting through the quiet country roads that lead to concord casks of balls barrels of linen hogheads of flints loads of beef and rice quantities of canteens and other articles to seize these stores so specifically enumerated in the old thong-bound account book of wagon-master goddard lieutenant colonel francis smith with the flank companies of the tenth regiment of foot and of several other corps embarked from boston common at about half past ten o'clock tuesday night the eighteenth of april crossed the charles river and began the march which was to bring on the american revolution he met and dispersed the forewarned minutemen on lexington green at five o'clock of the morning of the nineteenth of april he marched on to concord destroyed the stores and commenced the return at half past two his men thoroughly exhausted from their rapid march back toward lexington lay down within the hollow square formed by reinforcements which lord percy had led out from boston the retreat of the regulars along the country road has often been pictured in words the redcoats were harassed by the farmers who to use percy's own phrase surrounded and followed them like a moving circle firing from trees and stone walls a british soldier apparently in chatham's division of marines had his hat shot off his head three times lost his bayonet by a ball and had two holes in his coat as he pushed on to charleston colonel smith's men from the tenth regiment wore at this period three-cornered cocked hats bound with white lace scarlet coats faced and turned up with bright yellow and ornamented with white lace scarlet waistcoats and breeches white linen gaiters reaching above the knee white cravats and buff belts they were brave men of many battlefields and their discomfiture was a sight to stir the blood of every man in homespun who reached the scene each town has its story of that muster morning of the minute man who left his plough in the furrow the bucket at the well sweep or the fodder at the door of the cattle shed in some towns not above half a dozen able-bodied men remained at home through the nineteenth of april and the killed wounded or missing were credited to twenty-three different towns and villages the british reached bunker hill across the narrow neck which joins charleston to the mainland as the dusk began to make visible the flash of the muskets their pursuers halted while the militia officers held a consultation at the foot of prospect hill a guard was formed sentinels were posted as far as the approach to the neck and patrols were sent out to watch the enemy the militia then withdrew to cambridge another guard went to the brooklyn and roxbury shores south of boston to cover that territory until morning on the twentieth cambridge was searched for beef pork and cooking utensils while roxbury furnished a good supply of shipbread for the hungry men before noon the committee of supplies in concord had sent word that they were using every effort to forward provisions thus were the first difficulties overcome and an armed force began the siege of boston the men who encamped about boston had fought with perseverance and resolution they were not raw recruits for many had contended in the wars with french and indians and their names may still be seen on the king's muster rolls they were not a rabble recruited from the low ranks from which a city mob is drawn college and professional men did their part the death of a justice of the peace who was a graduate of harvard and held his commission under the crown caused a heated discussion in the british press some said that he was a spectator for they could not believe that the movement was respectable in the character of its supporters 
general howe writing to lord dartmouth a few months later stated half the truth when he said that the continental army contained many european soldiers and most of the young men of spirit in the country who gave diligent attention to the military profession lord percy had held that the americans were a set of sly artful hypocritical rascals cruel and cowards but after the battle of lexington he declared that the rebels showed an enthusiasm and a courage to meet death that promised an insurrection not so despicable as was imagined in england percy was quick to see that the indian method of fighting from behind trees and stone walls was proof not of cowardice but of ability to profit by conditions and said he they know very well what they are about soon after the events of the nineteenth men in the companies encamped near boston were asked by the committee of safety to enlist for service until the end of the year or for a shorter period at the committee's discretion a vigorous circular letter dated april twentieth was sent to the neighboring towns urging the enlistment of an army to defend wives and children from the butchering hands of an inhuman soldiery and on the twenty first the committee decided to raise an army of eight thousand effective men out of the massachusetts forces in the meantime the provincial congress had been hastily summoned and had resolved april twenty three seventeen seventy five to raise thirteen thousand six hundred men proposals were also made to the congress of new hampshire and governments of rhode island and connecticut colonies for furnishing men in the same proportion as an army of thirty thousand was deemed necessary a month later twenty four thousand five hundred men had been collected in the several colonies so thoroughly had the work of organization gone on in the colonies during seventeen seventy three seventy four and the spring of seventeen seventy five that an appeal for men when the siege of boston began was immediately successful throughout the country a network of local committees controlling militia companies and post riders bound together the opposition to the king this network was like a fuse which ran over thousands of miles of wood meadow and farmland the people had been able to follow every movement of the hostile british parliament through the aid of the committees of correspondence and inquiry these committees formed in each colony at the suggestion of the virginia house of burgesses in march seventeen seventy three watched the approaching storm tested the loyalty of those who professed to welcome it and guided the popular indignation when the battle of lexington came the colonies were as well prepared for war as the poor dependencies of a powerful nation could be the first news of the battle was brought to the ears of putnam at pomfret the next day and to arnold at new haven a day later john stark in new hampshire heard it in good time at ten o'clock on wednesday morning the nineteenth palmer of the massachusetts committee of safety wrote a letter from watertown to alarm the country quite to connecticut entrusting it to a writer who was to ask for fresh horses as he went at fairfield connecticut this message was overtaken by one written at three o'clock thursday morning and attested by the committee of correspondence from town to town the news reached new york on sunday the twenty third at noon and confirmed the rumors that had already begun to circulate by four o'clock a messenger was on his way to philadelphia about two o'clock of the twenty fifth a second express from new england reached new york his papers having been attested at new haven fairfield norwalk stamford and greenwich the same evening a copy reached elizabethtown at ten it was at woodbridge and signed at midnight it had reached new brunswick across the raritan and halfway through new jersey three hours and a half brought the good horse and its rider to princeton at half past six they were in trenton and by seven the attested papers were on their way to philadelphia the committee of the city sent the news at midday to chester at nine the men drew up at newcastle having followed the delaware through the gathering darkness he reached christine bridge at midnight with orders to forward the papers day and night at half past four in the gray of the morning of april twenty seventh he was at the head of elk in maryland and after travelling seventeen hours touching charlestown on the way he reached baltimore at ten that night 
a hard ride along the tortuous shore of chesapeake bay through the entire night brought the news to annapolis where carroll of carrolltown tagman and other patriots attested the papers and spread the tidings still on through alexandria and dumfries a long sunday journey brought the papers to fredericksburg where the committee signed at half past four carter bragston met the messenger at king william on may first nearly a fortnight after the battle to the southward went the news through surrey county williamsburg smithfield may third nasmond Cowan in north carolina edenton beaufort county bath newburn may sixth to onslow county where the committee received it at ten o'clock sunday morning of the seventh at wilmington on cape fear river harnett of the committee wrote for god's sake send the man on without the least delay and so the news was borne to the committee of little river and georgetown and on to charleston in south carolina what a ride and for what a cause through rain and sun and starlight this firebrand of rebellion was carried this was a ride that made the colonies into a nation and the nameless messengers and their horses deserve a page in history the continental congress resolved on june fourteenth that six companies of expert riflemen be immediately raised in pennsylvania two in maryland and two in virginia to reinforce the army near boston each company was to consist of a captain three lieutenants four sergeants four corporals a drummer or trumpeter and sixty-eight privates the besieging army was temporarily under the command of general artemus ward who received his commission from massachusetts as commander-in-chief on may twentieth four days earlier however the provincial congress had sent dr church to philadelphia to offer the direction of the army to the continental congress on june fifteenth george washington was appointed to command all the continental forces on july fourth seventeen seventy five it was announced in general orders that the troops of the united provinces of north america were taken over by congress the army then numbered not more than fourteen thousand five hundred men including perhaps the newly organized train of artillery which had been authorized in april by the province there existed also a coast guard which had been raised to defend the seaboard towns upon which the british made depredations in their excursions after food the army had scarcely settled down to besiege boston before the presence of slaves and free negroes gave rise to the question of their status in the army they had not apparently been included in the companies of militiamen and minutemen which were organized and drilled in the winter of seventeen seventy four seventy five but the moment a call for men went out the black men presented themselves for service in may the committee of safety faced the matter frankly in a resolve which is ethically curious for its differentiation of principles when applied to freemen and to slaves this resolve read that it is the opinion of this committee as the contest now between great britain and the colonies respects the liberty and privileges of the latter which the colonies are determined to maintain that the admission of any persons as soldiers into the army now raising but only such as are freemen will be inconsistent with the principles that are to be supported and reflect dishonor on this colony and that no slaves be admitted into this army under any consideration whatever the provincial congress considered the matter and laid it on the table free negroes continued to serve in the american camp and were conspicuous at the battle of bunker hill in june one man salem poor behaved like an experienced officer as well as an excellent soldier according to the testimony of colonel prescott they were obedient soldiers and useful laborers of a less mutinous spirit than some of their white brothers in july the provincial congress barred out all negroes but the question came to the front again in the autumn of seventeen seventy five when the enlistment of troops for seventeen seventy six was under discussion the council of general officers voted april twenty third to reject slaves and free negroes lord dunmore's proclamation in november seventeen seventy five freeing all indented servants and slaves who were able and willing to bear arms to induce them to join the british army 
probably forced a general order issued by washington december thirtieth allowing continental recruiting officers to enlist free negroes and promising to bring the whole matter to the attention of congress finally as a compromise congress permitted those who had served faithfully at cambridge to re-enlist blacks continued to serve in the army despite all legislative efforts to exclude them a return of negroes in washington's command august twenty four seventeen seventy eight shows that seven brigades then had an average of fifty four in each a hessian officer said in seventeen seventy seven one sees no regiment in which there are not negroes in abundance and among them are able-bodied sturdy fellows the employment of negroes met with approval in many of the colonies but not in the extreme south rhode island purchased the freedom of slaves before enrolling them as soldiers trusting to congress for financial aid and many men in colonel christopher green's regiment were obtained in this way the south true to its traditions refused the urgent appeals of colonel john lawrence in seventeen seventy nine and in seventeen eighty two for permission to enlist colored troops although congress had at last come to favor the scheme and it was backed by alexander hamilton and general green southern statesmen were by no means of one way of thinking on the slavery question and on the employment of negroes as soldiers the views which lawrence expressed to his father while highly creditable to a young man reared in south carolina were not such as would appeal to most slaveholders he wrote i would advance those who are unjustly deprived of the rights of mankind to a state which would be a proper gradation between abject slavery and perfect liberty and again i am tempted to believe that this trampled people have so much human left in them as to be capable of aspiring to the rights of men by noble exertions if some friend to mankind would point the road and give them a prospect of success habits of subordination patience under fatigues sufferings and privations of every kind are soldierly qualifications which these men possess in an eminent degree lawrence said with truth that five thousand black soldiers might change the course of the next campaign but it was the institution of slavery not the character of the slaves as washington himself intimated that placed obstacles in the way madison was disposed to favor the use of blacks in regiments with white officers and a fair proportion of white soldiers his correspondent joseph jones could see the blessings of emancipation but he wanted no hasty measures and nothing so uncertain in its results as the drafting in of slaves his statement of the case is strong and reasonable if they the enemy once see us disposed to arm the blacks for the field they will follow the example and not disdain to fight us in our own way and this would bring on the southern states inevitable ruin at least it would draw off immediately such a number of the best laborers for the culture of the earth as to ruin individuals distress the state and perhaps the continent when all that can be raised by their assistance is but barely sufficient to keep us jogging along with the great expense of the war the private who marched in his company to reinforce the army about boston felt somewhat as a voter did at a parish or a town meeting the company to which he belonged was his and the officers owed their authority in part to his favoring vote a private from new jersey has described the mode of procedure the men were sworn to be true and faithful soldiers in the continental army under the direction of the right honorable congress after this we chose our officers when on parade our first lieutenant came and told us he would be glad if we would excuse him from going which we refused but on consideration we concluded it was better to consent after which he said he would go but we said you shall not command us for he whose mind can change in an hour is not fit to command in the field where liberty is contended for in the evening we chose a private in his place could there be a more vivid picture of the private soldier at this period of the war there is the respect kept well in hand that is due the chief legislative body known as the right honorable congress 
there is also evidence of a matter-of-fact management of officers which must have been unknown to the benighted british soldier then comes that word of philosophy so characteristic of the age and of the undisciplined volunteer and finally in the election of a private as first lieutenant is shown that disregard of station which gives the picture its last touch on july nineteenth seventeen seventy five the army exceeded seventeen thousand men including gridley's regiment and crane's company of artillery in the latter part of seventeen seventy five washington had about nineteen thousand effective men near boston most of whom would return home when their terms of enlistment were expired in december or at the end of the year to pay off this army on the old establishment as it was called and to provide one month's pay in advance for the new establishment which was to be enlisted to carry on the siege required two hundred and seventy eight thousand two hundred and twenty eight pounds fifteen shillings or the sum of nine hundred and twenty seven thousand four hundred and twenty nine and one sixth dollars in the new army which was to have twenty thousand three hundred and seventy two men including officers the soldiers except drummers and fifers were to furnish good arms or when provided by congress to allow a deduction of six shillings from their pay a stoppage of ten shillings a month was to be made from each man's pay until his debt for clothing was cancelled although this was an unsatisfactory method at times and the payment of wages by the calendar month was even more disliked the soldier was told to be cheerful over the fact that he received higher pay than private soldiers ever had in any former war another blessing of war came when the colonies at the request of congress prohibited the arrest of continental soldiers for debts under thirty five dollars or the attachment of their property for sums under one hundred and fifty dollars when the principles involved in the creation of a new army for the year seventeen seventy six came under consideration the duration of the contest was very uncertain congress recommended to massachusetts and connecticut a two-year or a one-year term it was found that men hesitated to pledge their services for the entire war and at that time the military profession was so little known and so untried by those who were fitted only for the ranks that they did not turn to it as readily as they did to farming john adams contended that a regiment might possibly be obtained in new england of the meanest idlest most intemperate and worthless but no more a regiment was no army to defend this country we must have tradesmen's sons and farmers sons or we should be without defence and such men certainly would not enlist during the war or for long periods as yet the service was too new they had not yet become attached to it by habit was it credible that men who could get at home better living more comfortable lodgings more than double the wages in safety not exposed to the sicknesses of the camp would bind themselves during the war i knew it to be impossible this is the view of a shrewd observer of new england character a politician who it may fairly be said knew those of whom he wrote on the other hand he does not seem to count the influence of patriotism and love of adventure these certainly would have moved some to forsake their comforts and good wages for the army even had the term of service been long with a small permanent force many troubles of the next few years might have been banished provided of course the force was large enough to carry on the war the size of the army that could have been raised will always remain debatable the advantage of long over short terms of enlistment has the weight of all authorities familiar with raising equipping and drilling recruits washington himself said on this subject the evils arising from short or even any limited enlistment of the troops are greater and more extensively hurtful than any person not an eye-witness to them can form any idea of it takes you two or three months to bring new men in any tolerable degree acquainted with their duty it takes a longer time to bring a people of the temper and genius of these into such a subordinate way of thinking as is necessary for a soldier before this is accomplished the time approaches for their dismissal and you are beginning to make interest with them for their continuance for another limited period 
in the doing of which you are obliged to relax in your discipline in order as it were to curry favour with them by which means the latter part of your time is employed in undoing what the first was accomplishing congress had better determined to give a bounty of twenty thirty or even forty dollars to every man who will enlist for the whole time joseph hawley of the provincial congress might be quoted in reply that no bounty would induce new england men to enlist for more than two years the popular feeling in the autumn of seventeen seventy six is well shown by the following extract from a letter of josiah bartlett a delegate in congress from rhode island i am fully sensible he writes of the great difficulties we labor under by the soldiers being enlisted for such short periods and that it should have been much better had they at first received a good bounty and been enlisted to serve during the war but you may recollect the many and to appearance almost insuperable difficulties that then lay in our way no money no magazines of provisions no military stores no government in short when i look back and consider our situation about fifteen months ago instead of wondering that we are in no better situation than at present i am surprised we are in so good the colonies particularly at the north where democracy was less tolerant of militarism dreaded a standing army which to most minds had some close but mysterious connection with enlisting for the war among northern officers this feeling crystallized into a leaning toward colony affiliation in preference to congressional control governor ward of rhode island who was no enemy to the continental system attributed the slow enlistment under the new establishment to dislike of plans brought forward through southern influence favorable to an army wholly continental or attached solely to the congress the difficulties which were encountered in raising equipping and supporting a regular army led to the frequent use of militia this in turn hindered the pursuit of agriculture and brought about a greater scarcity of food while the constant coming and going of men some of whom had been hired at exorbitant rates a hundred and fifty dollars in specie for five months of service increased the consumption of supplies without adding proportionately to the effective force men were to be seen in the country taverns and upon the roads some returning from service some away on furlough and too many away through desertion in a war of great success their presence in the country might have encouraged enlistments by awaking a warlike spirit in a war of delay and hardships they must have done little or nothing to offset the heavy cost of travel and rations while on their journey the amusing experience of a not over-scrupulous private while on his travels has been related by himself the twentieth february seventeen eighty i leaves mr loudon's at new windsor and crosses the north river and comes to fishkill and goes to a officer to get a order to draw provisions and he happened to be there that i drew provision on the day before he said did not you draw eight days yesterday i found i was catched i said yes but that was to carry me to boston he said how could i draw at litchfield and at hartford i said i did not want to draw it there to have to carry it the captains and lieutenants were kept busy training raw recruits this work was not left to sergeants and corporals as it seemed best to have a closer bond between the officers and their men baron steuben was an ardent advocate of personal contact of officer and private he had no patience with the british custom of giving over the awkward squads to sergeants he rose at three in the morning during the manoeuvres says his biographer north drank a cup of coffee and smoked a single pipe while his servant dressed his hair at sunrise he was on horseback a year or two later when his theories of training had come to have their influence he said do you see there sir your colonel instructing that recruit i thank god for that his own interest in the rank and file was very real one day during the roll call steuben heard a private answer to the name arnold he summoned the man to his tent told him that so good a soldier should not bear a traitor's name and gave him permission to be known thereafter as steuben 
increase in the price of food and clothing which accompanies war tends to check the enlistment of married men and the rise in artisans wages still further operates in the same direction where men have families dependent upon them for support under these conditions the bounty or pay must be advanced as was ably set forth in the time of the civil war by governor oliver p morton of indiana in an address to congress in eighteen sixty two entitled increase of pay of private soldiers colonel courtland related to general gates a case that tells of the married man's trials the bearer hereof william foster a soldier in colonel onecup's regiment having lately buried his wife and has with him now at this place five small children and no way to provide provision for them unless he can be discharged to go to a small farm he has some distance from here and begs me to write in his favor to procure his discharge the privations of army life were trifling when compared with the worry that was caused by a knowledge of the privation at home the steady increase of taxes in seventeen seventy nine to eighty two and the departure of farm hands to the front drove women almost to desperation state and town officials endeavored to aid and support the wives and children of the soldiers and to check and punish those who forced up the necessities of life beyond the prices agreed upon by state or county conventions and accepted by the towns salt so necessary to every farm that had livestock rose from about thirty cents a bushel to almost as many dollars tea and molasses also advanced to a price that bore hard upon the poor women had the hard work of the farm with a suggestion or word of advice at long intervals from their absent husbands a private at the siege of boston wrote to his wife and children in seventeen seventy five i must be short get two or three bustles of salt as quick as you can for it will be dear and what cattle the barn will not winter i e hold through the winter the soller sol seller shall and give them as good a chance to thrive as you can and as for my coming home i cannot if you sent ten men in my room there was at the same time if dr benjamin rush is right in his assertion an increase in the birth rate in america implying prosperity or at least easy circumstances among a considerable part of the population in the larger centres of trade the increased circulation of money the growth in importation of goods and in transportation of grain with an undoubted demand for labour all combine to give an appearance of good times to that class which has nothing to lose by war the men about the taverns the small shops and the wharves married and cared for their families dr rush declares that from the year seventeen seventy six to the close of the war beggars were rarely seen the burdens of the war were not wiped out but were placed upon the owners of the soil poverty was lifted from the town poor to fall upon the farmers as it became more and more difficult for farmers to support their families it is no surprise to find that after the first enthusiasm had died away the enlistment of men was slow and unpleasant an officer would go to the village tavern wax eloquent and pass around the toddy until some country lad was moved to sign his name to the papers but unless an officer was shrewd he came away with his money spent and no recruit at his back that his errand was sometimes a relief to a town may be inferred from a note in graydon's memoirs mr heath helped us to a recruit a fellow he said who would do to stop a bullet as well as a better man and as he was a truly worthless dog he held that the neighbourhood would be much indebted to us for taking him away another writer has pictured the motley throng of men and boys in all stages of intoxication that gathered about a recruiting officer in a seaport town when the band which he employed to gather a crowd had stopped playing he stood at the street corner beneath a flag and sang in a comical manner all you that have bad masters and cannot get your due come come my brave boys and join with our ship's crew this was followed by cheers and a commotion in which men were persuaded or driven to the wharves and aboard a privateer that was ready for a cruise 
many undesirable army recruits were sent to camp and upon one occasion general parsons forwarded seven useless fellows to hartford that the connecticut legislature might see what imposition was practised by some recruiting officers congress decided in january seventeen seventy six to disapprove the employment of prisoners and thus closed to the enlistment officer a hopeful field for his efforts when voluntary enlistments fell off the authorities resorted to drafts these were not always successful especially in the disaffected districts where many officers and men so obtained proved to be tories at heart when the militia were well fed and clothed with good officers to make them contented numbers of the rank and file could be trusted at times to go home to gather recruits colonel thompson of south carolina on one occasion wished to send most of his men away on furlough so that they might return in time with lusty country lads at their heels no doubt there was an element less readily moved to enlist by patriotism than by material and tangible considerations however deep strong and broad the unseen current of loyalty might be a warm pleasant day in the autumn of seventeen seventy five and a cheering glass of grog helped the officers who were recruiting for the army of seventeen seventy six this the testimony of an officer at roxbury fairly represents the easy-going spirit which governed men of a certain class they were not the privates who studied by the campfire and kept diaries but many were none the less useful soldiers a battle sifts men by a process unknown to the days of peace bringing to the front unexpected heroes can you not see two of them now haines at bemis heights astride the muzzle of a british brass twelve-pounder ramming his bayonet into the thigh of a savage foe recovering himself to parry the thrust of a second and quick as a tiger dashing the same bloody bayonet through his head recovering again only to fall from the cannon shot through the mouth and tongue lying two nights on the battlefield until thirst hunger and loss of blood overcame him then in the ranks of the dead made ready for burial and from all this recovering for three years more of service and a green old age or again that unknown daredevil whose swaying figure stood out upon the parapets of the entrenchments above yorktown brandishing his spade at every ball that burred about him finally going to his death damning his soul if he would dodge the common people said general green referring to new england are exceedingly avaricious the genius of the people is commercial from their long intercourse with trade this spirit prompted many from the towns to make the best bargain possible when they enlisted for the year seventeen seventy six while the farmers who usually saw very little money coveted the bounty that was offered washington had an independent income the poorer officers and the rank and file depended for their subsistence and the support of their families upon their meagre and uncertain pay this difference in condition did not impress washington with sufficient force in his first encounter with the army there was no doubt a dirty mercenary spirit which to some extent made possible stock jobbing and fertility in all low arts to obtain advantage of one kind and another but that it pervaded the whole one must doubt the diaries of officers and privates written with no thought of publication show a loyalty and in some instances a religious earnestness that must indicate widespread moral purpose the character and care of the private soldiers were subjects for debate in every town that labored diligently to keep its quota of men in the field as the farmers sat about the fire in the stuffy town threshing the matter out a weather-worn weary volunteer home from furlough often sat there too and heard what they thought of him sometimes he had an opportunity to know what the leaders thought elijah fisher has described his interview with the committee of inquiry in boston whither he went to get satisfaction having complained because they deducted from the amount still due him as wages on account of the depreciation in paper money the bounty which he had received the punctuation has been added but the story is his 
one of the committee starting up with his great wig said the soldiers had been used very well sometimes these things were not to be got and then we could not have them as soon as we should wish i was wrong in accusing and talking as you do then spake up another that sat a little distance and heard what was said a black-haired man in my behalf and said that soldiers had been used very ill as this man said and that they were cheated out of a good eel that they ought to have it was no light task to bring an army into the field and maintain it for years combating successfully the local prejudices of northerner and southerner the greed for bounties the trials that follow a depreciating currency and an advance in the price of family necessities the fear of militarism and the dislike of strict discipline in an age of democratic theories that the army about boston had the virtues that characterized many of the soldiers themselves no one will doubt that it fell short in certain particulars may be surmised from the exclamation of a southern rifleman in the camp at prospect hill in september seventeen seventy five such sermons such negroes such colonels such boys and such great great grandfathers end of chapter one chapter two of the private soldier under washington by charles knowles bolton this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter two maintaining the forces with the coming of spring in the year seventeen seventy six march seventeenth the british evacuated boston and washington was free to turn his attention to new york the new field of action was far from the farms of many of the volunteers and they were anxious to be relieved from service the people in the central colonies were by no means united in support of the patriot cause and army life among them was not found to be as pleasant as it had been in new england the situation from a military point of view was more difficult than in massachusetts and washington learning his lessons as a commander in the school of experience made life harder for the rank and file recruits were few and there was need of some method to increase the army for the new enterprises early in june congress drew up a plan to enlist militia six thousand for the campaign in canada thirteen thousand eight hundred for new york and ten thousand for a flying camp in the middle colonies but the bounty of ten dollars which was offered had little effect upon men who could get a larger sum for shorter emergency service in the local organizations two other inducements were held out a gift of land as suggested by washington and a provision for soldiers who should be so injured that they could no longer serve in the army nor get their livelihood by their labor a serious obstacle which confronted the eastern states at this time in their attempts to fill their quotas was an excessive rage for privateering which drew from new england alone some ten thousand hardy brave men clever advertisements in the newspapers and alluring posters were handed about these with marvellous stories of spoils from the west indies repeated from mouth to mouth fostered discontent in camp and checked enlistments at home vast numbers said mrs adams were employed in privateering and officers were not too particular in the methods used to get recruits away from the militia self-interest said john paul jones and this only influenced owners and sailors who preferred privateers to the navy service looking at the matter in another way privateers were a blessing they offered protection to helpless seaport towns and discouraged petty marauding expeditions of the british against fishing villages this work of the privateers freed the militia from service in the coast guard and permitted a concentration of forces for larger undertakings the prevalence of smallpox about boston in the summer of seventeen seventy six added to the trials of massachusetts recruiting officers and made help from that section of the country less welcome to the army at new york but the need of reinforcements was so urgent that any risk seemed justifiable 
the effect of enlistments and drafts upon the population of a small town are described by mrs john adams in september seventeen seventy six forty men she writes are now drafted from this town more than one half from sixteen to fifty are now in the service i hardly think you can be sensible how much we are thinned in this province if it is necessary to make any more drafts upon us the women must reap the harvest i am willing to do my part i believe i could gather corn and husk it but i should make a poor figure at digging potatoes the absence of militiamen during harvest time was a serious loss to a town in the destruction of unharvested crops the knowledge of this preyed upon the minds of the farmer soldiers themselves and led to desertion in some parishes wrote colonel fitch of connecticut but one or two men are left some have got ten or twelve loads of hay cut and not a man left to take it up some five or six under the same circumstances some have got a great quantity of grass to cut some have not finished hoeing corn some if not all have got all their ploughing to do for sowing their winter grain some have got all their families sick and not a person left to take care of them it is enough to make a man's heart ache to hear the complaints of some of them in the southern colonies the minds of the recruits from the frontier or back country were frequently harassed by rumors of indian raids upon their homes officers at some times asked for furloughs or resigned and privates deserted in their desperation under these circumstances the most pressing calls for more troops met with little response from the people they felt that they had done enough and the legislatures were either unwilling or unable to urge them to further sacrifice if congress itself was slow to see the need of a greater army the disaster at long island in august produced an immediate change upon september sixteenth congress voted that eighty-eight battalions be enlisted to serve during the war each non-commissioned officer and private was promised a bounty of twenty dollars and a hundred acres of land were to be given to him or to his representative if he was slain by the enemy before the close of the war the expense necessary to procure the land was to be borne by the states in the same proportion as the other expenses of the war the states were to provide arms clothing and every necessity the cost of the clothing to be deducted from the pay of the men a little later however congress voted a suit of clothes or twenty dollars if the soldier owned the clothes to be given annually as a further inducement washington in general orders november tenth seventeen seventy six announced that those who enlisted into the new army would have the usual pay and rations but no boys or old men and no deserters would be received at the same time the army regulations were repealed and a more rigorous code was put in force to bring the service to a higher standard of discipline the plan to raise eighty-eight battalions so simple on paper developed endless complications the states as might be expected found it difficult to fill their quotas and they resorted to additional bounties connecticut and massachusetts voted twenty shillings a month to privates above that allowed by congress and thirty-three and one-third dollars additional bounty new jersey offered fifty-three and a third dollars maryland objected to giving money in any case and wished to substitute land at a meeting of new england delegates to regulate prices the plea was made that congress would not increase the pay of soldiers to meet high prices and a large bounty was the last resort massachusetts then offered eighty-six and two-thirds dollars and new hampshire did the same in this confusion the bewildered recruits stood irresolute hoping that bounties had but just begun their upward course meanwhile the eighty-eight battalions had to be filled by drafts of one man in four or five excluding however those already in service those in seaboard or frontier towns schoolmasters students and a portion of those employed in powder mills the men who served in the artillery known as bombardiers and matrosses held back so persistently that washington was forced to offer an advance in pay of twenty five per cent to obtain the necessary numbers the continental army had its first time of serious privation in the winter that was just setting in 
the soldiers in the northern camps especially deserve to share the fame that came to those who suffered and survived at valley forge a year later a gentleman writing from ticonderoga december fourth seventeen seventy six concluded his letter with the words for all this army at this place which did consist of twelve or thirteen thousand men sick and well no more than nine hundred pair of shoes have been sent one-third at least of the poor wretches is now barefoot and in this condition obliged to do duty this is shocking to humanity it cannot be viewed in any milder light than black murder the poor creatures is now what's left alive laying on the cold ground in poor thin tents and some none at all and many down with the pleurisy no barracks no hospitals to go in the barracks is at saratoga if you was there your heart would melt i paid a visit to the sick yesterday in a small house called a hospital the first object presented to my eyes one man laying dead at the door then inside two more laying dead two living lying between them the living with the dead had so laid for four-and-twenty hours i went no further this was too much to see and too much to feel for a heart with the least tincture of humanity to ticonderoga the men had marched cheerfully a great part of them barefooted and barelegged in this condition they were forced to look forward to sentinel duty in the snow of a northern winter a british officer in a letter dated at york island october thirty seventeen seventy six states that the rebel army are in so wretched a condition as to clothing and accoutrement that i believe no nation ever saw such a set of tattered malians there are few coats among them but what are out of elbows and in a whole regiment there is scarce a pair of breeches judge then how they must be pinched by a winter campaign such were the hardships endured by the army disease and cold thinned the ranks that had borne the attack of british infantry so great was the demand for men that not a few deserted to re-enlist and the temptation increased with the duration of the war a punishment of a hundred lashes had little effect and in seventeen seventy eight a man was shot who had deserted and re-enlisted for the bounties seven times for him there was no semblance of excuse but for some who went home without leave a word in extenuation might be said they received few of the blessings usually that the recruiting officer held before trusting eyes they lived for months without proper or even decent food and clothing fighting in some cases for a country that had known them but a few years and against friends and neighbors of their youth if they had been drafted or had been induced to sign enlistment papers when dazed by liquor their consciences did not hold them to service in the army later on an officer after complaining that the troops had been for two years without clothes and pay affirmed that there must have been virtue in the army when under such circumstances there was any army left a sentence in his diary which refers to a practice not uncommon in the early years of the war is good enough to bear repeating this day one of our soldiers which deserted some time ago deserted back again with a new suit of clothes weak as the continental army was in the autumn of seventeen seventy six it undertook two important duties part of the forces held the hudson above new york to check any advance of the british toward canada or new england another wing of the army kept to the banks of the delaware to guard the highways to pennsylvania and the south on december twenty second just before the battle of trenton was fought the return of the army then encamped on the banks of the delaware gives a total of ten thousand one hundred and six men of these three thousand three hundred and fifty seven were sick absent on duty or on furlough making thirty three per cent ineffective it was the current belief that affairs had come to a critical pass requiring a successful battle to awaken enthusiasm and quicken enlistments for the next campaign washington's capture of nearly the whole british outpost at trenton on christmas night accomplished what was needed but in order to follow up the success he was driven to a fresh bounty of ten dollars to keep the discontented men together for another month 
the year seventeen seventy seven with its defeats at the brandywine and at germantown brought little cheer to the main army until the news of burgoyne's surrender came in october throughout the summer washington never had above eleven thousand continentals and two thousand militia in the field at one time at the close of july congress abandoned the expensive and unsatisfactory system of appointing army officers as recruiting agents the states were to be divided into districts with a local officer in each district who was to receive eight dollars for every man enlisted and five dollars for each deserter secured washington expressed approval of an annual draft of men to fill the regiments that became reduced by death disease or the withdrawal of those who could not be induced by a bounty of twenty five dollars to remain in the service beyond the terms of enlistment at the beginning of autumn the army numbering some ten or eleven thousand men marched through front street philadelphia on the way to check the advance of general howe alexander graydon stood at the coffee-house corner and watched them pass the commander-in-chief and his men they were he says indifferently dressed but carried their well-burnished arms like good soldiers who might reasonably expect success in a contest with equal numbers they were obliged to fall back a few days later before kniphausen's advance over brandywine creek at chad's ford and cornwallis's flank attack by way of birmingham church greatly outnumbered but not put to rout general howe occupied philadelphia and thus achieved one object in the british plan of campaign while the moral effect of this move was considerable at the time philadelphia being the great port of trade of the middle colonies and a centre for army supplies of all kinds he had however done little harm to washington and he now found that he must divide his army in order to protect both philadelphia and new york to put down the rebellion of an agricultural people scattered over a wide territory by a garrison in each town would have required more soldiers than england possessed the other movement of the year burgoyne's attempt to isolate new england by seizing lake champlain and the hudson which taken together formed a natural western barrier ended in his capitulation washington looked forward to winter quarters where the men could be near enough to the scene of action to furnish comfort to supporters of the patriot cause where they could be drilled by baron steuben and could be so fed and protected from the weather that sickness and desertion would not destroy the army it seemed necessary to be at least a day's march from the enemy to afford time for defensive measures or for a retreat in case the british made a hostile move he therefore withdrew up the eastern bank of the schuylkill some miles to the northwest of philadelphia crossed the river on december thirteenth by two bridges one old and insecure and another improvised from boats and fence rails and on the nineteenth went into camp at valley forge by january first most of the troops were settled in huts and they soon began to improve in discipline under the instruction of baron steuben who toiled with the zeal of a lieutenant anxious for promotion the sufferings of the continentals at valley forge during the winter of seventeen seventy seven seventy eight without sufficient clothing blankets or shoes and much of the time destitute of proper food are described in a succeeding chapter an army of about seventeen thousand men had melted away until now in seventeen seventy eight five thousand ragged soldiers remained a tory writer reported in march that one thousand one hundred thirty four deserters had come into philadelphia and taken the oath of allegiance it is worthy of notice in support of washington's frequent request for recruits of american birth that just three-fourths of these deserters were foreign-born the effective force was further decreased by the pernicious habit of employing privates as officers servants steuben has mentioned as an illustration of the system a certain company which had twelve men present absent one man as valet to the commissary two hundred miles distant from the army for eighteen months one man valet to a quartermaster attached to the army of the north for twelve months four in the different hospitals for so many months two as drivers of carriages and so many more as bakers blacksmiths carpenters even as coal-porters for years together 
these men once on the rolls were reported regularly as part of the effective force with the opening of the spring campaign congress called upon the states to maintain their quotas and in may resolved to grant eighty dollars at the end of the war to every non-commissioned officer and private who had enlisted or would enlist for or during the contest in august it was reported that a great spirit of enlisting had taken place among the militia drafts a proposition to pay part of the usual bounty of twenty dollars in specie instead of bills would have helped the movement along but on a vote it was lost and an appropriation of a hundred and twenty thousand dollars in continental money was made the much desired consummation of treaties with france was hailed with celebrations in the army and the virtual victory at monmouth following clinton's evacuation of philadelphia served in a sense to offset the loss of savannah which was not known in camp until the new year came in the opening weeks of seventeen seventy nine disclosed conditions that might well have discouraged washington himself congress authorized him to offer a bounty not to exceed two hundred dollars in addition to the usual bounties of clothing and at the expiration of the war of land and money to be given to each man engaged for the war later where the bounty offered by a state exceeded two hundred dollars this sum was ordered to be put to the state's credit for each recruit furnished to prevent the jealousies that might otherwise arise from too great inequality in the amount of bounty to be had when the national and local bounties were combined washington already began to fear that the enlistments would prove a failure unless the state rivalry in offering large bounties was brought to an end new jersey offered two hundred and fifty dollars over and above the bounty voted by congress georgia offered three hundred dollars and virginia promised clothes land and seven hundred and fifty dollars to recruits naturally these sums in spite of the depreciation in paper bills made the soldiers who had enlisted earlier to serve for the whole war uneasy and vexed that they had accepted a paltry twenty dollars congress perceived this and allowed a hundred dollars to each man who had enlisted for the war previous to january twenty three seventeen seventy nine you may wrote the commander-in-chief in july form a pretty good judgment of my prospect of a brilliant campaign and of the figure i shall cut in it when i inform you that excepting about four hundred recruits from the state of massachusetts a portion of which i am told are children hired at about fifteen hundred dollars each for nine months service i have had no reinforcements to this army since last campaign some months earlier the baron de kalb had said that so long as the substitutes hired by rich citizens for the militia could get enormous bounties for a two months walk as the short enlistment was called there was no hope for the regular regiments in october washington's force engaged for the war amounted to fourteen thousand nine hundred and ninety eight men to these must be added twelve thousand one hundred and one men engaged for short periods making in all twenty seven thousand ninety nine of whom four hundred and ten were invalids in the meantime the towns throughout the country were approaching the end of their resources in their ability to furnish recruits town meeting followed town meeting to fill quotas of men and provide beef clothing and firearms training bands and alarm lists were scrutinized for recruits and at meetings attendance was secured by a threat to draft first from those who remained away from these deliberations in massachusetts which still furnished nearly a fifth of the infantry battalions the towns finally were divided into as many classes as there were men to be raised each class to furnish and pay for a man or pay the average price paid for continental soldiers with twenty five per cent added somewhat earlier in connecticut any two men were exempted from draft so long as they could keep a recruit in the field a practice that led to the employment of negroes and lowered the grade of recruits the success of the recruiting service varied according to local conditions and particularly where the people were influenced by frequent reports from the army rivington's gazette april seventeenth seventeen seventy nine stated that the rebels who were fed with putrid salt beef and wretched whiskey were ready to desert from a service which they despised and detested 
while the new hampshire gazette ten days later reported that there was a great eagerness to enlist that nine-tenths of the southern forces being pleased with their food and their superior clothing had re-enlisted nearly all newspaper statements of the time were more or less inaccurate and intemperate and the information made public by british and american editors and particularly the loyalist editors was colored beyond recognition for several years indians and tories from the lake region in central new york had harried the frontier settlements in washington's rear the indians kept under cultivation some twenty thousand acres of corn and thousands of fruit trees inhabiting the rich lands from lake ontario at the north to tioga point the meeting place of the chemung river with the susquehanna just within the bounds of philadelphia on the south in the summer of seventeen seventy nine general james clinton started from schenectady by way of otsego lake and its outlet the upper susquehanna to meet general john sullivan who marched northward from easton along the lehigh river and the lower susquehanna they joined forces at tioga point and late in august drove the british and their savage allies from their stronghold on the chemung near the present city of elmira the devastation which followed put an end to the great indian highway between canada and the chesapeake dispersed the enemy that menaced washington in the rear and left him free to face sir henry clinton's army a careful french resume of the situation concludes with the opinion that affairs were alarming but not desperate in the autumn of seventeen seventy nine that the country like a convalescent needed nourishment rather than medicine and a careful nurse rather than a physician the year seventeen eighty with the loss of charleston the defeat at camden and the treason of arnold seemed to portend surrender at last but forces were at work that were to outweigh them all in the fortunes of war in france the colonies grew in favor and the french fleet appeared upon the american coast in england now at war with france and spain the king's policy was about to add holland to the circle of her enemies while in the colonies the continentals under the eye of that indefatigable disciplinarian the baron steuben grew into an army of hardy patient and obedient soldiers there were ten thousand four hundred rank and file that spring on the north river to oppose a british force of eleven thousand washington asked for fifty regiments or thirty five thousand eight hundred and fifty men congress had already lost much of the prestige which made its wish effective in seventeen seventy five and as it had ceased to exercise the right to issue paper money it could neither enlist pay nor feed a single soldier the commander was obliged to rely largely upon his own efforts to rouse the country had congress supported with courage despotic laws similar to those enacted eighty-four years later by the confederate congress it is possible that the people would have held that the occasion justified the action to enlarge its force in the field the confederacy employed free negroes and slaves in every position at home and in camp where a white man could thereby be released for army duty by an act of february seventeenth eighteen sixty four every white resident between the ages of seventeen and fifty became at its passage a part of the military service of the confederate states until the end of the war the condition of washington's army in the autumn of seventeen eighty was so disheartening that a hostile observer could hardly overcolor the picture of ragged half-fed battalions thinned by desertion disease and the expirations of terms of service benedict arnold the traitor of less than two weeks standing under his majesty's protection has described the army of eleven thousand four hundred men half of whom the militia would return to their homes on january first these men illy clad badly fed and worse paid having in general two or three years pay due to them were the result of an appeal for thirty five thousand soldiers who were to drive sir henry clinton out of new york and end the war the public debt he added amounted to four hundred million paper dollars and congress jealous of the army and powerless over the states could do little provisions were of necessity taken from the people and this swelled the tide of discontent arnold's picture of the army was drawn from a knowledge of the facts scarcely inferior to washington's own the mutiny of the pennsylvania line at the beginning of the new year resulted naturally from these conditions 
a plan for the reduction of the regular army after january one seventeen eighty one to four regiments of dragoons or cavalry four of artillery forty nine of infantry with six hundred and twelve men in each exclusive of colonel hazen's regiment colonel armand's partisan corps major lee's corps and one regiment of artificers was approved by congress in october seventeen eighty little was accomplished in this direction until near the end of the war morgan's victory over tarleton at the cowpens in january seventeen eighty one was followed by the defeat of green at guilford hobkirk's hill and utah springs but these seemingly unfortunate incidents in green's masterly southern campaign were soon to be overshadowed by the siege of lord cornwallis's army at yorktown and the surrender which came in october the cessation of active hostilities was very welcome to america although defensive measures were by no means exhausted washington and green had come to know the strategic possibilities of the country which lies between the mountains and the atlantic coast the broad rivers that everywhere flow southerly and easterly to the sea formed barriers and the long stretches of sparsely inhabited country seriously hindered the operations of an invading commander who struck inland for any distance from his ships while the struggle was waged now in the eastern now in the central now in the southern colonies great tracts of land could be cultivated in comparative peace regardless of a depreciating currency an anxious congress or a ragged army the recruiting officer was the only reminder of strife that came into many a quiet cabin in the forest clearing with the seed planted or the grain gathered men were ready to shoulder their muskets for a short campaign just as the scotch highlanders waited for the autumn harvest before raiding the lowlands in the spring of seventeen eighty two the british house of commons declared that all who should advise the further prosecution of offensive war in america would be considered as enemies to his majesty and the country the continental military establishment at this time was in the neighborhood of thirty five thousand men with an effective french force of four thousand troops the british establishment including detachments at charleston savannah halifax on the penobscot and in canada with the militia at new york was supposed to be about twenty six thousand men the resignation of lord north in march and the signing of preliminary articles between great britain and the united states in november prepared the way for a cessation of hostilities early in seventeen eighty three on april nineteenth peace was announced to the soldiers by washington the days of trial were over for the army which in the commander's words was of nearly eight years standing six years they had spent in the field without any other shelter from the inclemency of the seasons than tents or such houses as they could build for themselves without expense to the public they had encountered hunger cold and nakedness they had fought many battles and bled freely they had lived without pay and in consequence of it officers as well as men had subsisted upon their rations they had often very often been reduced to the necessity of eating salt pork or beef not for a day or a week only but for months together without vegetables or money to buy them during these eight dark years the officers and men who served under washington grew more and more to know that a great man led them in correspondence in journals and in the conversation of visitors who had come from europe the commander of the continental army was mentioned with a regard rarely if ever before bestowed during life upon the central figure of a bitter war for independence his letters were preserved by the families of british officers and british historian john richard green with rare comprehension of his character has said of him no nobler figure ever stood in the forefront of a nation's life washington was grave and courteous in address his manners were simple and unpretending his silence and the serene calmness of his temper spoke of a perfect self-mastery it was only as the weary fight went on that the colonists discovered however slowly and imperfectly the greatness of their leader his clear judgment 
his heroic endurance his silence under difficulties his calmness in the hour of danger or defeat the patience with which he waited the quickness and hardness with which he struck the lofty and serene sense of duty that never swerved from its task through resentment or jealousy that never through war or peace felt the touch of a meaner ambition that knew no aim save that of guarding the freedom of his fellow-countrymen and no personal longing save that of returning to his own fireside when their freedom was secured it was almost unconsciously that men learned to cling to washington with a trust and faith such as few other men have won and to regard him with a reverence which still hushes us in presence of his memory End of chapter two chapter three of the private soldier under washington by charles knowles bolton this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three material needs a column of infantry in a country highway giving a touch of color and life to the landscape might well fire the pulse of any lad and at the opening of the revolution the glamour of military service supplementing as it did the patriotic spirit caused the volunteer army about boston to increase in numbers from day to day coming from the hills and plains until the british looked out upon a besieging camp but experience as it ever does cooled the pulse and cleared the brain then the country boy began to examine the soldier's knapsack and the size of his blanket washington shows in his revolutionary correspondence that he knew these simple things and when mutiny and desertion alarmed the colonies he sought the only permanent remedy a greater degree of comfort for his men the soldier's bed was often under the stars of heaven or the clouds of a threatening storm if he was fortunate enough to possess a tent he fared better but did not always escape the rain the conversation recorded by a connecticut surgeon expresses a condition which was far too frequent good morning brother soldier how are you all wet i thank ye says the other hope you art so when the sun reappeared after a storm tents were struck for a few hours to let the ground dry and were pitched again at nightfall few troops had suitable covering at the camp in cambridge in seventeen seventy five except the troops from rhode island their tents were according to rev mr emerson in the most exact english style for the most part the shelters were as dissimilar in form as the men were in dress and each one was somewhat of an index to the character of its owner some were of boards and others of sailcloth some a combination of both while stones brush and turf were forced into service huts made of fence rails sod and straw could not be moved to dry or clear the ground but they were in winter warmer than tents boards were used for floors when they were to be had and also for the construction of the huts if there was a sawmill near the camp otherwise logs did duty as in pioneer days with the interstices filled with clay moss or straw each hut was supposed to have two windows it could be built in about two weeks and the company officers not infrequently lent a hand in rude cabins like these arranged in lines which extended back from the cycle about one and a half miles the greater part of washington's army passed the winter months at valley forge beset from without by sleet and wind from within by heat and smoke until the eyes of the men smarted almost beyond endurance the situation of the camp had much to do with the health and comfort of the men five sarcastic reasons for the selection of valley forge as a place in which to pass the winter of seventeen seventy seven seventy eight are worthy of record first there is plenty of wood and water secondly there are but few families for the soldiery to steal from though far be it from a soldier to steal thirdly uh, not given fourthly there are warm sides of hills to erect huts on fifthly they will be heavenly minded like jonah when in the belly of a great fish sixthly they will not become homesick as is sometimes the case when men live in the open world since the reflections which must naturally arise from their present habitation will lead them to the more noble thoughts of employing their leisure hours in filling their knapsacks with such materials as may be necessary on the journey to another home 
dressing and the morning meal were events which varied in importance for at times there was little to wear and less to eat in the campaign about white marsh in december seventeen seventy seven a soldier remarked we had no tents nor anything to cook our provisions in and that was pretty poor for beef was very lean and no salt nor any way to cook it but to throw it on the coals and brile it and the water we had to drink and to mix our flour with was out of a brook that run along by the camps and so many a dippin and washin in it which made it very dirty and muddy the cooking was often done by soldiers from each company for men who had skill in any direction were soon called upon to perform special service nothing remarkable this day a private relates only i was joe's cook for our room consisting of twelve men and a hard game too sometimes there were no more than two kettles in which to prepare the meals for a company the meat was broiled over the fire spitted on a bayonet and the bread was baked in the hot ashes the men counted themselves fortunate if they could dine in peace at the siege of boston a man was quietly eating his bread and milk when a cannon-ball struck near by and so covered the bowl with flying dirt that he could eat no more the following daily allowance or ration was authorized by the third provincial congress june tenth seventeen seventy five one one pound of bread two half a pound of beef and half a pound of pork and if pork cannot be had one pound and a quarter of beef and one day and seven they shall have one pound and one quarter of salt fish instead of one day's allowance of meat three one pint of milk or if milk cannot be had one gill of rice four one quart of good spruce or malt beer five one gill of peas or beans or other sauce equivalent six six ounces of good butter per week seven one pound of good common soap for six men per week eight half a pint of vinegar per week per man if it can be had during the siege of boston all allowances for the week were delivered on wednesday unless the number of regiments made it necessary to serve a part of the army on other days in the winter months corned beef and pork were given out four days a week a pound and a half of the former and eighteen ounces of the latter per diem onions at two and eight pence a bushel and potatoes or turnips at one and four pence a bushel might be substituted for peas or beans the ration authorized by washington at valley forge in the spring of seventeen seventy eight called for one and a half pounds of flour or bread one pound of beef or fish or three-quarter pound of pork and one gill of whiskey or spirits or one and a half pounds of flour one half pound of pork or bacon one half pint of peas or beans and one gill of whiskey or spirits these amounts were varied according to the state of the stores and camp washington writing to the president of congress june twenty eighth seventeen seventy six estimated the cost of a ration at eight pence york currency or a trifle more in the report of the committee on the commissary department agreed to by congress june tenth seventeen seventy seven a ration was to be considered as worth ten ninetieths of a dollar or a little over eleven cents when the army was in camp a market was established where farmers were allowed to offer their produce for sale and one settling booth was permitted within each brigade's limits where liquor might be sold at fixed prices milk was brought in from the country for the sick whenever it could be had but the exorbitant sums asked by farmers were a frequent source of vexation and privation at peekskill general putnam in seventeen seventy seven fixed the prices of provisions and made the penalty for buying articles at prices above those authorized the forfeiture of the produce or the value in money later when milk could not be obtained at sixpence a quart an officer and thirty men were detailed from each regiment to collect cows sufficient in number to supply the needs of the army and to care for them until the owners would agree to the terms fixed by the general the army often suffered from the scarcity of vegetables because perishable food could not be carried as readily as beef in sullivan's campaign against the six nations of indians the men fared well nuts and melons are mentioned in many diaries and also corn or maize which was ripe when the invading columns reached the first indian villages 
after corn became too old to boil or roast it was converted into meal tin kettles found in the red man's huts were perforated and used to grate the kernels and every fourth man not on guard it is said sat up at night to play the part of miller this meal was mixed with hot pumpkin or boiled squash and kneaded into cakes which were baked in the coals food of this kind was of great importance in preventing the diseases which arise from a steady diet of meat so great occasionally was the need of vegetables that a commander felt justified in ordering each regiment to prepare ground and plant seed on the chance that headquarters would not be moved before the time of harvest congress meanwhile urged the colonies to encourage agricultural societies when provisions were scarce the allowance per man was reduced sometimes to a half pound of flour a day a half pound of beef with five gills of salt to a hundred pounds of beef at times the soldiers had no vinegar at other times no vegetables or bread in the midst of distracting quarrels among jealous officers washington sent out appeals for aid writing our soldiers the greatest part of last campaign and the whole of this have scarcely tasted any kind of vegetables had but little salt and vinegar which would have been a tolerable substitute for vegetables having been in a great measure strangers to neither have they been provided with proper drink beer or cider seldom comes within the verge of the camp and rum in much too small quantities thus to devouring large quantities of animal food untempered by vegetables or vinegar or by any kind of drink but water and eating indifferent bread are to be ascribed the many putrid diseases incident to the army in the winter of seventeen seventy nine and seventeen eighty the army was sometimes for five or six days without bread often as long without meat and once or twice two or three days without either men in the arnold expedition against quebec many a night lay down without food in captain goodrich's company several became very weak from hunger and at last captain dearborn gave them his pet dog the soldiers carried the poor creature away and ate every part of his flesh not excepting his entrails two other dogs were eaten the same day a story is told of two soldiers in another campaign who being out of provisions put a stone in their camp kettle when a certain colonel wines was expected the colonel soon stopped before their fire and inquired well men anything to eat not much they replied what have you in that kettle a stone colonel for they say there is some strength in stones if you can only get it out this guileless conversation had the desired effect for the officer declared that they must have something better to eat in times of distress it was vexing to find that the wagon drivers had ruined the pork by drawing out the brine to lighten the load or to see a clumsy fellow endeavoring to guide through the marshy road four or five horses attached to a wagon from which barrels of flour and other perishable provisions tumbled into the mud at harlem heights soon after the battle of long island the general saw about the camp large pieces of fine beef left untouched to putrefy in the sun the food was frequently poorly cooked from a scarcity of wood for the fires and the few trees near a camp were the source of angry disputes i thought said washington one day that different regiments were upon the point of cutting each other's throats for a few standing locusts near our encampment to dress their victuals with the quartermaster-general was instructed to investigate complaints regarding food and to punish careless cooks and bakers in wayne's command each regiment or corps had an officer appointed weekly whose duty it was to visit the kitchen or place for cooking in every company to see that the work was properly done and that meat was boiled not fried it was recommended that flour be drawn from the stores two days in each week so that small dumplings could be made for the soup when the kitchen had no roof but the sky the soup was often too thoroughly permeated with burnt leaves and dirt to be palatable better cooking especially baking became a pressing necessity finally all bakers were placed under a director without whose license no baker could work for the army a year later a company of bakers was authorized to consist of seventy-five men and a director who was to receive fifty dollars a month and three rations a day 
the beef was poor all through the winter of seventeen seventy seven seventy eight so lean and thin that it became a matter of jest a butcher who wore white buttons on the knees of his breeches was seen bearing a quarter of beef into camp there tom cried a soldier is some more of our fat beef by my soul i can see the butcher's breeches buttons through it it is not strange that the doctor who records this conversation was fervently grateful for a good stomach that he might endure fire-cake and water for breakfast with water and fire-cake for dinner at evening the cry could be heard along the line of soldier huts at valley forge no meat no meat that the men under these conditions still showed a spirit of alacrity and contentment was marvellous were soldiers to have plenty of food and rum wrote dr waldo i believe they would storm Tophet. the fare of the enemy was not always better than that of the continental soldiers if confidence may be placed in the remark of a diarist that biscuit taken from the british regulars were hard enough for flints the question of a sufficient supply of good food was of the first importance and was seemingly as little understood by politicians of the day as was the effect of clothing on enlistments or of enlistment for short periods on the success of a campaign washington estimated that thirty thousand men would require for twelve months at least two hundred thousand barrels of flour and forty million pounds of meat to obtain these supplies each year was one of the great tasks imposed upon the commander-in-chief and had confidence in washington not grown from year to year and made his appeals effective the revolutionary war must have failed to prevent the entire dissolution of the small permanent force which was deemed necessary during the winter months of inactivity food had to be saved for the support of these men that should have been available to maintain the militia when called upon for important enterprises the method adopted to obtain supplies was simple in theory the amount of flour meat and other necessities to be procured was apportioned to the various colonies to be collected transported and deposited at such places within the respective colonies or states as the commander-in-chief might from time to time designate the same lack of a central authority strong enough to use force which made it next to impossible to collect clothing draft men raise money or punish deserters played havoc with the commissary department but when washington in his vigorous earnest appeals stirred the people near at hand they never failed him the crises were always safely passed and the war went on to the end next in value to good food may be placed clothing upon which depended largely the health degree of cleanliness and soldierly pride of the army frequent wars throughout the colonies from the earliest times had fostered the military spirit along the atlantic coastline and inland frontier towns at the outbreak of the revolution militia and independent companies were to be found in all the colonies and styles of uniform were almost as numerous as company organizations from the simple dress of the new england alarm list companies to the elaborate costumes of the private corps in new york philadelphia or virginia was a long step and thus it happened that the levies raised from time to time on short enlistments to reinforce the continental army formed a motley gathering in the ranks at the siege of boston were men dressed as savages as backwoodsmen's and some with uniforms not unlike those of the british regulars the general hue of the ranks however not only in the campaign before boston but through much the larger part of the war was sombre and can best be indicated by saying that the browns and greens predominated congress seems to have recognized this in an order to the commissioners at the court of france in seventeen seventy seven to send uniforms of green blue and brown colors the popular blue and buff were not worn by the continental rank and file from new england or the south and the new york and new jersey troops for whom the combination was designated between seventeen seventy nine and seventeen eighty two were much of the time destitute of cloth of the proper colors during the opening months of the revolution the troops that had no distinctive uniform were as far as possible clothed as washington suggested in a hunting shirt 
a long loose coat and in long breeches to which were attached gaiters or small cloths buttoned at the sides and held down by straps under the shoes the gaiters or leggings were often made of tow cloth which had been steeped in a tan vat until it became the color of a dry leaf this uniform was sometimes called the rifle dress there were ruffles of the same material around the neck and on the bottom of the coat on the shoulders at the elbows and about the wrists the hat was round and dark with a broad rim turned up in three places in one of which there was usually a cockade of some color or a sprig of green a white belt over the left shoulder held the cartouche box a black cloth or stock went about the neck and the hair was bound in a queue at the back this costume was in the minds of the british associated with a skilful marksman and washington in the summer of seventeen seventy six urged its importance in these words it is a dress which is justly supposed to carry no small terror to the enemy who think every such person a complete marksman at bunker hill a rifleman standing upon the earthworks was noticed by an englishman to have shot as many as twenty of howe's officers before he fell and in the saratoga campaign ambury watching the effect of their fire attributed to the americans a love of killing the british had reason therefore to fear the rifleman's dress the provincial congress of massachusetts resolved july five seventeen seventy five to provide thirteen thousand coats faced with the material of the coat without lapels short and with small folds each regiment to have its number on the pewter buttons the general orders from headquarters at cambridge july twenty four seventeen seventy five recommended indian leggings instead of stockings as washington hoped to obtain from the continental congress a hunting shirt for each man leggings were also warmer than stockings more lasting and could be had in uniform color congress on november fourth seventeen seventy five resolved to provide clothing for the army to be paid for by stoppages out of the soldiers wages at the same time it was ordered that as much as possible the cloth be dyed brown and the distinction in regiment be indicated by the color of the facing it will be noticed that there was little attempt to introduce bright colors which were less serviceable and less easy to obtain in the campaign about new york in seventeen seventy six many soldiers had no uniforms and these men were provided with hunting shirts in october seventeen seventy six congress voted to give annually to each soldier who would enlist for the war a suit of clothes to consist that year of two linen hunting shirts two pair of overalls a leathern or woolen waistcoat with sleeves one pair of breeches a hat or leather cap two shirts two pair of hose and two pair of shoes writing to governor trumbull in january seventeen seventy eight washington gave his opinion on a serviceable form of clothing and added a word as to the value of trousers now so universally adopted i would recommend a garment of the pattern of the sailors for jacket this sets close to the body and by buttoning double over the breast adds much to the warmth of the soldier there may be a small cape and cuff of a different color to distinguish the corps as the overall is much preferable to breeches i would recommend as many of them as possible the difference desirable in winter and in summer is shown in the following letter in june should be given a waistcoat with sleeves flannel if to be had two pair of linen overalls one shirt a black stock of hair or leather a small round hat bound and a pair of shoes in january a waistcoat to be worn over the former close in the skirts and double-breasted resembling a sailor's to have a collar and cuff of a different color in order to distinguish the regiment a pair of breeches woolen overalls yarn stockings shirt woolen cap and a blanket when really necessary watch coats ought if possible to be provided for sentinels trousers or overalls were more and more recognized as necessary and congress by a resolution of march twenty three seventeen seventy nine directed washington to fix and prescribe a uniform for the soldiers being governed by the supply woolen overalls for winter and linen for summer to be substituted for the breeches 
the adoption of blue coats followed in the fall for in general orders dated at moore's house october second seventeen seventy nine the commander ordered that the coats of the infantry be blue with white linings and buttons the new england troops were to be distinguished by white facings those of new york and new jersey by buff facings those of pennsylvania delaware maryland and virginia by facings of red and the troops of the carolinas and georgia by blue with buttonholes edged with white tape or lace the artillery coats were to be faced and lined with scarlet they were to be edged with tape as well as the buttonholes and the buttons and hat bands were to be of yellow finally the light dragoons or cavalry were to be distinguished by blue coats with white facings linings and buttons it will be noticed that blue and buff had no standing in eleven of the thirteen states although blue now became the military color of the united states signs of merit common to all parts of the country were adopted toward the close of the war in august seventeen eighty two washington directed that a non-commissioned officer or a private who had served honorably for more than three uninterrupted years should be permitted to wear upon the left sleeve of the uniform coats a narrow angular piece of cloth of the color of the regimental facing for six years of service a parallel stripe might be added unusually meritorious action earned for the soldier a purple heart of silk or cloth edged with lace or binding to be worn on the facing over the left breast the uniforms of all the infantry and cavalry were later ordered to be blue faced with red and lined with white the buttons also to be white this order from the scarcity of scarlet cloth did not prove effective until the war closed the revolution quickened the production of cloth duck russia sheeting toe-cloth osnaburgs tickleburgs as it did that of shoes gunpowder and firearms throughout the country towns women carded and spun the wool and flax which their husbands provided and the cotton which came from the west indies then they themselves or itinerant weavers wove the flannel linen and corduroy in new england they usually received but values are not very easy to set down five or six pence a skein of fifteen knots about a yard and a half and their day's work of from two to five skeins brought the value of five or ten pounds of beef or to state it again one or two good dinners at the tavern prices in virginia in seventeen seventy six varied greatly john harrower a scot mentions in his diary a payment of five shillings a pound for spun cotton to run eight yards per pound or about seven pence a yard weaving brought the same or a less amount many towns had mills for producing cloth and the business of supplying the army grew rapidly the campaign of seventeen seventy five however was fought by men who had no clothing at hand suitable for very cold weather and in many cases no blankets between their bodies and the ground the insufficient clothing was more serious in the expedition led by montgomery in the autumn of seventeen seventy five to montreal his proclamation promising every article of clothing requisite for the rigors of the climate was intended to satisfy the men who were willing to go forward it shows that they might expect blanket coats coats waistcoats breeches one pair of stockings two shirts leggings sacks shoes mittens and a cap the way to canada might be said to have been paved with promises and it proved to be a rough road in december seventeen seventy six washington referred to the distresses of his soldiers many of them being entirely naked and more so thinly clad as to be unfit for service the hardships of the year before had dampened the enthusiasm of the farmers and enlistments fell off the men had ragged shirts and many marched with their feet bare a few days of active service resulted in sickness for want of proper covering at night and lameness for lack of shoes many deserted impelled by indignation at what was believed to be the bad faith and indifference of the colonial assemblies 
colonel angel of rhode island writing from peekskill in august seventeen seventy seven to the governor of his state declared that the condition of his regiment was so scandalous that the members of the other corps and people in the villages along the line of march called his men the ragged lousy naked regiment these troubles reached their worst form in the winter at valley forge in seventeen seventy seven seventy eight and in the summer which followed the new york gazette at this time reported humorously that congress was not prevented from making more paper dollars by scarcity of rags for independent of the large supply expected from washington's army as soon as they can be spared we have reason to believe the country in general never abounded more in that article the dress of the soldiers was a favorite subject for jest in one form or another among the british a poem addressed to washington who had issued a proclamation to the people calling upon them to fatten their cattle for his army has the lines and for the beef uh, there needs no puff about it in short they must content themselves without it not that we mean to have them starved why marry the livestock in abundance which they carry upon their backs prevents all fear of that upward of two thousand men were unfit for service in november seventeen seventy seven in december there were two thousand eight hundred and ninety eight men in camp unfit for duty many with no shoes and some without shirts many were confined to hospitals and farmhouses with feet too sore to bear unprotected the winter snows when the trampled mud froze suddenly the rough ridges were like knives and although men cut up their blankets and bound the strips about their feet the flesh was soon as unprotected as before still others in their huts sat by the fire through the night and dozed unwilling to lie far enough from the coals to sleep a fourth or fifth of the army passed the summer of seventeen seventy eight about white plains without shoes and many with tattered shirts and breeches the winter of seventeen seventy nine eighty was endured by many without suitable covering at night and it is not strange that the young men in the country towns demanded exorbitant bounty money when asked to enlist in the following spring if the continental congress could have offered good clothing and sufficient food soldiers might have been found for little or no bounty a vivid picture of virginia troops is given by thomas ambury in his untrustworthy but readable book of travels the writer claims that the colonel was proud of their appearance and went about with two troopers before and two behind him bearing drawn swords ambury writes as to those troops of colonel bland's virginia regiment with washington's army i cannot say anything but the two that the colonel has with him here for the purposes of expresses and attendants are the most curious figures you ever saw some like prince pretty man with one boot some hoseless with their feet peeping out of their shoes others with breeches that put decency to the blush some in short jackets some in long coats but all have fine dragoon caps and long swords slung around them some with holsters some without but god a mercy pistols for they have not a brace and a half among them but they are tolerably well mounted while considering the lack of clothing washington wrote to general lincoln what makes the matter more mortifying is that we have i am positively assured ten thousand complete suits ready in france and laying there because our public agents cannot agree whose business it is to ship them a quantity has also lain in the west indies for more than eighteen months owing probably to some such cause the effect of this kind of official inaction upon the private may be illustrated by an old soldier's experience which he described to the historian of the first new hampshire regiment this man had at the time of these troubles a furlough to visit his home but the journey was a long one before he could start he was obliged to spend two days in cutting up his blanket to make for himself breeches and a pair of moccasins 
two months before the siege of yorktown began the men were so destitute of clothing that the french troops encamped near by made jokes on the nudity of the continentals yet such was their loyalty to the cause of the colonies that when two ships from spain arrived with supplies and some of the coats were found to be red in color like those worn by the british the americans ill-clad as they were refused to wear them a humorous view of the veterans was taken by the peaceable man as he styled himself when he ventured to prophesy that if the war is continued through the winter the british troops will be scared at the sight of our men for as they never fought with naked men the novelty of it will terrify them times changed however and the winter of seventeen eighty two eighty three was passed at newburgh in comfort the men were better fed well clothed and sheltered ragged uniforms and poor food for a long time not only discouraged enlistments but injured the efficiency of the men in the service soldiers grumbled and if they did not come to open mutiny they grew careless about their appearance and negligent in their habits our men washington wrote in the orders of the day for january one seventeen seventy six are brave and good men who with pleasure it is observed are addicted to fewer vices than are commonly found in armies if a soldier cannot be induced to take pride in his person he will soon become a sloven and indifferent to everything else whilst we have men therefore who in every respect are superior to mercenary troops they are fighting for two pence or three pence a day why cannot we in appearance also be superior to them when we fight for life liberty property and our country end of chapter three chapter four of the private soldier under washington by charles knowles bolton this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter four firelock and powder although guns were far more generally used at the outbreak of the revolution than they are to-day a serious problem in each campaign was to provide firearms for the troops each farmer in seventeen seventy five had his trusted flintlock made usually by the hand of a village gunsmith with the disappearance of village artisans much of the charm and prosperity of rural towns has taken flight the little shop of the cordwainer or shoemaker no longer resounds to the merry tapping of the pegs or the creaking of the waxed threads in his hands the cooper and the broom maker are so rare that few of the present generation have seen the one crowding his staves into place and the other shaping the broom corn about the handle the itinerant weaver too has passed away and the miller no longer grinds the coarse flour cornmeal and buckwheat which delighted the children of a bygone age who of us looking through the advertising pages of a popular magazine will feel any sentiment for the factories and mills pictured there those unlovely successors of the vine-covered shops of the cordwainer the cooper the gunsmith to polish the barrel of a gun with buckskin and to keep a gloss on the stock by frequent use of oil and wax required more time than the average soldier could or perhaps would give so that during the war many of the firelocks soon wore out from exposure to the weather some were lost in difficult marches and others becoming broken could not easily be repaired since the parts were usually hand-made and a new part had to be fitted to its place the continental congress july eighteen seventeen seventy five in recommending the formation of militia companies suggested that each soldier have a good musket that would carry an ounce ball a bayonet steel ramrod worm priming wire and brush fitted thereto a cutting sword or tomahawk a cartridge box to contain twenty-three rounds of cartridges twelve flints and a knapsack the barrel was to be three and a half feet long in time congress established a continental gun factory at lancaster pennsylvania and a gun lock factory at trenton when the militia soldier provided his own firelock his contribution to the cause was considerable for those days in massachusetts a gun and bayonet were estimated by the provincial congress to be worth two pounds in pennsylvania in seventeen seventy six a gun brought about the same amount 
in virginia in 1778 a gun appears to have been worth from three pounds to five pounds and a rifle a pound or two more a drum was valued at half as much at this time five pounds would buy about fifteen cords of wood pay a laborer for two weeks work or purchase some fifty bushels of coal the flintlock or firelock as it was commonly called was an effective weapon when supplemented by earthworks at bunker hill after two splendid but ineffective advances against the americans in their hastily formed defences general howe saw that the bayonet was his last resource to silence their destructive fire at long island the british used the bayonet with deadly effect by receiving the fire of washington's men and charging before they could reload therein lay the weakness of the firelock for the manner of loading was clumsy and slow the end of the cartridge a paper case filled with ball and powder was bitten off and a little powder was sprinkled on the pan the remainder of the contents was then dropped into the muzzle of the barrel and held in by ramming down the cartridge case like a wad the powder in the flash pan ignited by sparks from the contact of a flint with the battery a piece of steel communicated through a hole with the charge in the barrel from this description it will be evident that the manual of exercise called for movements more intricate in loading and reloading than were required later when the percussion lock came into use until the introduction of baron steuben's plan in seventeen seventy nine the form of exercise in the regiments was influenced by the previous training of the colonels in english french or german methods the english systems in use in the colonies before the war naturally had the greatest vogue in seventeen fifty seven the militia bill was passed in england to provide thirty two thousand men for home defence so that the regular army could be employed abroad as the new levies were to exercise but one day a week a simple form of discipline was desirable and that devised for the county of norfolk became so successful for drilling militia that it was known widely as the norfolk discipline this plan was in favour in new england as early as seventeen sixty eight when an abstract was published at boston and timothy pickering's simplification of the norfolk was much used at the north early in the war colonel bland's treatise published first in seventeen twenty seven was more or less in use in the south a copy had been in washington's library for many years the massachusetts provincial congress however had in seventeen seventy four adopted the british army manual of seventeen sixty four known as the sixty fourth which at the time the new haven edition appeared was in general use in connecticut rhode island and massachusetts bay the words of command and motions for priming loading and firing a flintlock may be of interest in this age of rapid fire machine guns the explanations are not given in full as they are very detailed to obtain uniformity in company drill one poise your fire locks two motions one lock outward fire lock perpendicular two left hand just above the lock and of an equal height with the eyes two cock your fire locks two motions three present one motion one six inches to rear with right foot but end to shoulder four fire one motion five half cock your fire locks one motion six handle your cartridge one motion one slap your pouch seize cartridge bite the top well off seven prime one motion one shake the powder into the pan eight shut your pans two motions nine charge with cartridge two motions one put the cartridge into the muzzle shaking the powder into the barrel two hand on rammer ten draw your rammers two motions eleven ram down your cartridge one motion twelve return your rammers one motion thirteen shoulder your fire locks two motions one left hand under butt two right hand thrown down at side these actions were much the same in all the manuals although in the norfolk they were begun chiefly from the shoulder and not as here from the rest baron steuben made his words of command shorter and sharper 
in the manoeuvres greater divergence appears at this time there were two serious objections to the firelock the soldier required so long to load and fire it that a rapid advance of the enemy close upon the discharge found him with no weapon ready for defence so that he was apt to be overcome with panic and the two qualities of powder needed in the cartridge and the pan for effective firing were difficult to obtain franklin advocated the introduction of pikes and in a letter in seventeen seventy six gave strong reasons for the use of bows and arrows claiming that a man could send four arrows for every bullet that his vision was not clouded by smoke that his enemy seeing the arrow he could not see a bullet had his attention diverted from his duty and when struck he was less able to fight it is interesting to hear colonel thompson a successful militia officer of south carolina advocate the next year for his regiment one hundred complete riflemen with good horses and spears the use of an old-time musket which now seems so cumbersome led to frequent accidents in august seventeen seventy five for example a man forgot to stop the end of his powder horn he flashed the powder in the pan of his gun so near to the horn that there was a conflagration which burned many soldiers another man lowered his gun to recock it when there was a report and the gun kicked him in the breast producing instant death the force of these firelocks may be illustrated by an accident that happened in december seventeen seventy five john mcmurray who was cleaning his gun put in the priming and pulled the trigger not knowing that it carried a load the shot went through a double partition of inch boards through one board of a berth through the breast of a man named penn and hit a chimney leaving its mark there the scarcity of firearms made it necessary in the autumn of seventeen seventy five for washington to order that no soldier was to carry away his arms if they were fit for use private property would be appraised and purchased in the following january he authorized colonels to buy guns which the militia were willing to sell and yet a month later two thousand men in camp lacked arms colonel rodzima's regiment in may possessed in all ninety-seven firelocks and seven bayonets in july of the critical summer of seventeen seventy six nearly one-fourth of the army had no arms and the new york convention ordered that each militia man without arms should bring with him a shovel spade pickaxe or a scythe straightened and made fast to a pole one method of obtaining weapons was to disarm all disaffected persons and another means of increasing the supply was to purchase through local committees of safety the arms owned by men who for one reason or another were not likely to engage in active service in pennsylvania county committees of safety by authority of the province assembly appointed three collectors for each township these men could call upon the nearest colonel of militia for aid or could bring before the committees any recalcitrants congress urged upon the colonies the need of encouraging gunsmiths and the colonies themselves imported large consignments of firearms from bordeaux in france pleine pinay et of nantes did a large export business and claimed that they were able to send arms and powder directly from the royal manufactories lead was to be had with less effort that for the campaign of seventeen seventy six was taken from the statue of king george on the bowling green and from the housetops of new york and the amount needed for the operations of seventeen seventy seven came from leaden spouts and window weights of philadelphia as the bore of the muskets differed in size the bullet moulds were often of various sizes and were joined together so that a soldier could make balls to fit any firelock the running of balls running the lead into the moulds was a frequent duty in camp it was noted one day by david howe in his diary that he went to prospect hill after he had done his stent running ball a quarter of a pound of buckshot or a pound of lead to be cast into ball to suit the bore was a proper allowance for a man in stark's regiment each man on the day of bunker hill fight had a flint in his gun and was served a gill cup full of powder and fifteen balls for his cartridges 
powder was the crying need through much of the war as early as seventeen seventy four the provincial congress of massachusetts made an effort to provide powder in december connecticut sought to obtain more powder and mr shaw a new london ship owner offered a swift vessel to go to the west indies for this purpose to maintain a post within musket shot of the enemy for six months together said washington without powder and at the same time to disband one army i e of seventeen seventy five and recruit another within that distance of twenty odd british regiments is more probably than ever was attempted every effort was made to purchase powder to encourage the manufacture of it and to have the people save nitre and sulphur the provincial congress two months before the battle of lexington took place resolved to appoint a committee to draw up directions in an easy and familiar style for the manufacture of saltpetre these to be printed and sent to every town and district in the province at the public expense furthermore the congress agreed to purchase all the saltpetre manufactured in the province for the next twelve months at a stated price after the passage of this act a simple countryman it is said brought into the house half a bushel of saltpetre which he had made and promised that more could be made in eight months than the province had money to pay for his method the same as that described in the official watertown pamphlet is in the language of a contemporary letter to take the earth from under old houses barns and so forth and put it lightly into a hogshead or barrel and then fill it with water which immediately forms a lie this lie he then puts into an ashes leech that has all the goodness extracted before this being only as a strainer after it is run through which he boils the lie so clarified to a certain consistence and then puts it to cool when the saltpetre forms and is immediately fit for use and from every bushel of earth he produces three-quarters pound saltpetre on this information the act was suppressed for amendment the congress at philadelphia aided in the quest for powder by authorizing suspension of the non-importation agreement in the case of vessels bringing gunpowder or sulphur with four times as much saltpetre or brass field pieces or muskets with bayonets allowing them to carry out the same value generously estimated in produce from the colonies congress on june tenth seventeen seventy five recommended to the several towns and districts in the colonies that they collect all their saltpetre and sulphur to be sent from the northern colonies to new york from the central colonies to philadelphia and from those farther south to their committees and conventions to be manufactured into gunpowder the committee of safety in philadelphia not only published the description of a process for making saltpetre but called upon the local committees of each county to send two persons to learn the business at their works these men when trained were at the committee's expense to travel from town to town for the purpose of instructing others in the art the flint was characteristic of the gun of this period the blunderbuss a short gun with a large bore clumsy and inaccurate of aim had nearly passed out of use the old-time slow match which ignited the priming powder had given away to the grooved wheel with serrated edges rotating against a flint and this in turn passed out of use when the flint was fastened into the jaws of the cock and sprung against the steel hammer or cover plate of the flash pan each man when possible had at least two flints and also a wooden driver or snapper which was substituted for the flint at the time of exercise to prevent unnecessary wear of the stone a good flint would fire sixty rounds before it had to be repaired but the habit of snapping the lock was so prevalent that few flints did so much service flints were not easily obtained and workmen who could shape them were few when a vein of prodigious fine black flint stone was discovered upon mount independence near ticonderoga in seventeen seventy six the commanding officers of regiments were ordered to inquire if there were among their soldiers any old countryman who understood the hammering of flints 
at the beginning of the war the farmers had their powder horns many of which bore designs and phrases expressing the sentiments of their owners it was soon discovered that paper cylinders filled with powder and balls and bound at either end with jack thread were more serviceable they were ready for use in an emergency and in time of rain or snow on the other hand they could not be withdrawn except by firing the gun and when powder was scarce the battalion or regimental guards quarter guards they were called were instructed it would seem to charge their pieces with powder and running or loose fitting balls that there might be no waste of ammunition the number of rounds carried by each man was less than the british regulars had at almost every period of the war owing to the scarcity of cartridge paper and powder at the battle of bunker hill most of the men were said to have fired thirty rounds in the quebec expedition arnold's men had only five rounds apiece and during the winter of seventeen seventy five seventy six washington felt that he could not risk more than twelve or fifteen rounds at a time in the hands of the men later on the continental soldiers carried as many as twenty-five or forty rounds to be used against the sixty of the regulars given the firelock with powder and balls there was still to be considered the man behind it his skill and courage were worthy the attention of the commander himself in his book of orders under date of june twenty ninth seventeen seventy six washington said to his soldiers he the general recommends to them to load for their first fire with one musket ball and four or eight buckshot according to the size and strength of their pieces if the enemy is received with such a fire at not more than twenty or thirty yards distant he has no doubt of their being repulsed when placed behind earthworks or a stone wall this had proved the best of devices in the open field enough disciplined troops would survive such a fire to fall upon the raw recruits with fixed bayonets before they could in their inexperience load and deliver a second volley but the regulars were scarcely a match for the militia when protected by earthworks officers constantly advised the militia to hold their fire until the enemy approached to within a few yards of their defences they gave orders also to aim with care for they knew that many of the ranks were marksmen when five hundred volunteers were to be levied in the mountains of virginia in seventeen seventy five so many men came forward that the commanding officer made his selection by a trial of skill a board one foot square bearing a chalk outline of a nose was nailed to a tree at a distance of a hundred and fifty yards or about the space covered by fifteen to twenty houses in a modern city block those who came nearest the mark with a single bullet were to be enlisted the first forty or fifty men who shot cut the nose entirely out of the board at bunker hill the american works were silent until the british were within forty yards and where companies of grenadiers had stood three out of four even nine out of ten in some places lay dead or wounded in the long grass a scotchman living in virginia said two months later that the slaughter of june seventeenth was to be attributed to the fact that the americans took sight when they fired End of chapter four chapter five of the private soldier under washington by charles knowles bolton this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter five officer and private it is difficult to ascertain just what washington thought of the private soldiers when by a disgraceful retreat as once happened he was left in imminent danger of capture he was incensed at the cowardice of his men when he saw them enlist where they were offered the largest bounty he scorned their avarice but when they suffered and were patient were tested and proved loyal and courageous he loved and praised them he put his trust in the native rank and file and chose for his bodyguard only those born in america or those who were bound to the land by the strongest ties of blood the privates bore hardships such as in his opinion would have broken the spirit of foreign soldiers in the spring of seventeen seventy eight he wrote from valley forge 
to see men without clothes to cover their nakedness without blankets to lie on without shoes by which their marches might be traced by the blood from their feet and almost as often without provisions as with them marching through the frost and snow and at christmas taking up their winter quarters within a day's march of the enemy without a house or hut to cover them till they could be built and submitting to it without a murmur is a proof of patience and obedience which in my opinion can scarce be paralleled colonel john lawrence a young officer at headquarters shows in his letters a frank affection for the men whom he desired to command i would cherish he said those dear ragged continentals whose patience will be the admiration of future ages and i glory in bleeding with them from the words of washington and of lawrence it is reasonable to suppose that the rank and file were kindly remembered in the deliberations of those who formed the commander's official family washington knew the trials of the men who served under him his kindly heart tempered the course of justice because he could measure the strength of their temptations but officers were not always men of character or to use the old word men of true quality and the private reasonably patient under almost unheard of privation and suffering chafed beneath the yoke of militarism at the south the owner of a plantation having large opportunities for culture by means of his great wealth commanded respect and having many servants he grew to exercise the voice of authority at the north there was none of this and a distinction between officer and man did not prevail in the rural militia of new england this was due in part at least to the leveling influence of small farms the private's company officers were not infrequently his intimate friends or even his inferiors men who had devoted their time to the local militia organization and had become familiar with drill and tactics while he perhaps was busy with other matters the private could not understand why he should salute such neighbors because they were in camp or why he should ask of them permission to go beyond the lines when the men gathered at the siege of boston they were at first allowed much liberty a soldier wishing to go home for a few days wrote a letter to a friend or relative and asked him to come to camp as a substitute before many weeks had passed the men noticed the increasing rigor of army discipline even a man of superior education rev william emerson commented upon the great distinction made between officers and soldiers where every one was made to know his place and keep in it on pain of receiving thirty or forty lashes intelligent opinion was on the whole against the popular social philosophy of the day when applied to army life joseph reed writing to his wife october eleventh seventeen seventy six remarks where the principles of democracy so universally prevail where so great an equality and so thorough a levelling spirit predominates either no discipline can be established or he who attempts it must become odious and detestable a position which no one will choose you may form some notion of it when i tell you that yesterday morning a captain of horse who attends the general from connecticut was seen shaving one of his men on the parade near the house the same impression was gained by james wilkinson who noticed in the camp at boston but little distinction between colonel and private graydon is another witness he recalls the story of colonel putnam chief engineer of the army who was seen with a large piece of meat in his hand what said a friend carrying home your rations yourself colonel yes he replied and i do it to set the officers a good example and graydon adds that if putnam had seen any aristocratic tendencies in the army they must have been of very recent origin and due to southern contamination it was not at all uncommon for company or even regimental officers to give to their sons or younger brothers positions which were below commissioned rank but rank came to be more jealously guarded as time went on in seventeen seventy nine at a brigade court-martial captain dexter for behaviour unbecoming the character of an officer and a gentleman in frequently associating with the wagon-master of the brigade was sentenced to be discharged the service 
earlier in the war lieutenant whitney for infamous conduct in degrading himself by voluntarily doing the duty of an orderly sergeant was sentenced to be severely reprimanded among a rural people at the north the lieutenant's act of kindness could hardly have merited severity except as it injured discipline in other regiments in the south more was expected captain bernard elliott's diary has this entry the lieutenant-colonel cannot think the major could so far have overlooked the officer's command and authority as to order shepherd a private to take a power only due to an officer he assures the regiment that in future if an officer suffers his prerogative to be trampled upon which he ought to support he will be considered by him as a man wanting in that essential which constitutes the officer the practical results of the doctrine of equality when put in force were occasionally made evident by disorder and mutiny while the lack of a proper difference in pay for the officer and the private may have justified in the mind of the private this attitude of equality it could not have been the dominating influence among the troops from new england if it was among those from the middle and southern colonies washington calls it one great source of familiarity but the farmer of to-day is more jealous of his right of familiarity with the rich than with the poor and more watchful as his neighbor prospers to his reasoning a larger income brings no enlarged prerogative in social affairs where social distinctions were closely observed as in the south a marked difference in pay was more essential to the management of the rank and file but the difficulty existed and washington wrote to the president of congress september twenty fourth seventeen seventy six while those men consider and treat him an officer as an equal and in the character of an officer regard him no more than a broomstick being mixed together as one common herd no order nor discipline can prevail what was the governing cause of this trouble many have answered the question in much the same words captain john chester of connecticut soon after the experience at bunker hill commented upon the fear of all officers from the captain-general to a corporal that the people would brook no exercise of authority and added the significant words the most of the companies of this province meaning massachusetts bay are commanded by a most despicable set of officers one explanation needs no proof to convince us of its truth where officers depended for their commissions upon their ability to raise companies or to persuade companies to serve under them the test was of popularity and not of military skill it proved impossible in massachusetts for many men to play the double role of recruiting officer and disciplinarian before the same body of soldiers with success several officers who would have made excellent privates or officials in civil employment were turned out of the army in disgrace before the war was fairly begun if discipline depends upon those in command what could be expected at bunker hill of a company whose captain ordered the men to march into battle promising to overtake them directly and never appearing until the next day i have said washington already broke one colonel and five captains for cowardice or for drawing more pay and provisions than they had men in their companies general lee and captain chester both speak of the absence of officers from bunker hill of lack of discipline and of readiness to retreat among many companies of privates who had not so much as a corporal to command them men who had had little or no discipline at home needed a strong hand in camp but a hand that they could respect as to the materials i mean the private men wrote charles lee they are admirable young stout healthy zealous and good-humoured and sober but to quote joseph hawley there is much more cause for fear that the officers will fail in a day of trial than the privates it was the officers who failed in their duty if failure there was at bunker hill they were the drill masters on the green but when the best stuff of the town was put under them and they were no longer merely drill masters but leaders they could not fill the measure they were not always gentlemen in so far as that term implies leadership in thought and action some were petty mercenary overbearing and themselves ill-trained to obey their official superiors 
these new england men said lee the professional soldier are so defective in materials for officers that it must require time to make a real good army out of them the same sentiment was voiced in almost the same words by another famous general of the war nathaniel green we want nothing he said but good officers to constitute as good an army as ever marched into the field our men are much better than the officers it would not be well to condemn many for the failings which were too evident in a few but the testimony of men like lee and green suggests that when the private fell short in discipline and obedience as frequently happened he was not alone at fault the charge was once made that the rank and file served for money while the liberties of america were preserved by the patriotism of officers in this connection a half-serious remark of washington's reported by an officer at valley forge seems applicable so many resignations of officers said he that his excellency expressed fears of being left alone with the soldiers these resignations if we may believe colonel reed were sometimes prompted by cowardice i am sorry to say he writes in seventeen seventy six too many officers from all parts leave the army when danger approaches it is of the most ruinous consequences a failing among officers which was happily much less common than mediocrity or even cowardice was that of theft or embezzlement the soldiery were nearly helpless in the hands of those who withheld the pay of their men from month to month until mustered out of service or brought to book by a court-martial the new hampshire committee of safety to mention a single case voted august sixth seventeen seventy six that lieutenant gilman pay over to his men the coat money which he had the previous year received for them and had declined to deliver it would be unfair perhaps to assume that these malpractices were more evident in the revolutionary army than in any other army of volunteers and it should be said that the self-sacrifice and heroism shown by officers all over the colonies did much to put spirit into the rank and file an officer's ability to command carries with it a presumption that there is good discipline and obedience in the ranks john adams complained that soldiers loitered along the country roads and idled in the taverns in camp also from time to time there was a lack of discipline soldiers were known to be on friendly terms with the enemy and careless sentries allowed their guns to be stolen while they were on duty the practice of hiring one's duties done by another did not sweeten the lot of the poorer soldier although this could hardly have been of frequent occurrence refusing to do duty or threatening to leave the army were not uncommon breaches of discipline brought about often by the unreasonable conduct of officers timothy burnham corporal for keeping seymour on sentry from six o'clock in the evening until seven the next morning was reduced to the ranks moses pickett for disobedience of orders and damning his officer was sentenced to receive thirty lashes and afterward to be drummed out of the regiment the firing of guns in and about the camp was a constant annoyance that could not be stopped and during the siege of boston british soldiers hearing frequent reports followed by no casualties came to ridicule american marksmanship many of these acts of insubordination however are common to all armies in the winter of seventeen eighty eighty one the mutiny of the pennsylvania line consisting at that time of six regiments was one of the serious events of the war the men were in huts near morristown under the command of general wayne many of them had been engaged for the ambiguous term of three years or the war and now feared that they might be pressed to serve beyond the three-year period of their enlistment at a time when recruits were receiving large bounties for short service their own pay was already many months in arrears their food was poor and insufficient and their ragged clothes were filthy reports were current that officers had used the men cruelly but these carried little or no weight the first day of the new year was celebrated with an undue allowance of spirits 
and soon the men were ready to be stirred to rebellion by the picture of their sufferings artfully drawn by demagogues between nine and ten o'clock of the same evening the mutiny broke out under the lead of sergeant williams a deserter poor and fond of drink a number of officers were killed or injured in a futile attempt to restore order and the men with six pieces of artillery set off for princeton they marched with an astonishing regularity and discipline allowing general wayne and two of his officers to accompany them on the second day wayne asked for a conference with one man chosen by the soldiery from each regiment hoping as he said soon to return to camp with all his brother soldiers who took a little tour last evening but the rank and file would not listen to his proposals and the mutineers marched again on the fourth washington meantime apprised of events was using every effort to bring about an agreement he asked of the states a suit of clothes for each man and three months pay clinton of the british army was not idle he sent a message addressed to the person appointed by the pennsylvania line to lead them in their present struggle for their liberty and rights in which he offered to protect them pardon any of their number for past offences pay them what was due from congress and leave them free to give up military service if they wished these were generous terms offered by the mother country to her sons in rebellion as they recalled their privations and the uncertainty of their fate when they should again be in the power of congress they could hardly be expected to disappoint clinton yet as they put it they preferred not to turn arnold's the committee of congress and governor reed for the council of pennsylvania offered terms which the mutineers accepted the men who had enlisted indefinitely for three years or for the war were to be discharged unless they had voluntarily re-enlisted and where the original papers were not to be had the oath of the soldier was to be sufficient evidence certificates for the depreciation on their pay were to be given and arrearages were to be made up as soon as possible clothing a pair of shoes overalls and a shirt was to be furnished as indicated in the proposals finally no man was to be brought to trial or censured but the past was to be buried in oblivion when these negotiations were completed the british spies were given up and executed many of the men according to washington's letter to steuben dated february sixth seventeen eighty one took the oath before the proper papers could be procured and by perjury got out of the service the new jersey gazette in a discussion of the revolt remarks that the satisfactory conclusion will teach general clinton that though he could bribe such a mean toad-eater as arnold it is not in his power to bribe an american soldier the unfortunate affair was not without other lessons for men who could not be bribed needed the best efforts of the commissary department in their behalf the restless element wanted a firm hand also if the loyal majority was to remain obedient a few months later at yorktown twelve plotters stepped out before the regiments and persuaded the men to refuse to march because the promises made to them had not been kept wayne then addressed them earnestly and called upon a platoon of soldiers to fire either upon him who with his officers had been humiliated by the former disgrace or upon the instigators of this fresh mutiny at the word of command they presented and fired killing six of the twelve leading rioters one of the remaining six was badly maimed and wayne ordered a soldier to use his bayonet this the man refused to do claiming that the mutineer was his comrade the general instantly drew his pistol and would have shot the soldier had he refused longer to carry out the order general wayne then marched the regiments about the lifeless bodies and ordered the five remaining mutineers to be hanged in a recent work on the french army Declay's trooper thirty eight o nine there was evidence of much friction between company officers and men while something of the kind was suggested as the cause of the mutiny of the pennsylvania line this rumor never gained credence the want of clothing and food was too evident a source of discontent the following order of general john rutledge of south carolina in seventeen seventy six 
bears upon the relations between officers and their men and it has the right spirit it reads any officer that shall strike a soldier at any time hereafter whatsoever the provocation may be such act of striking shall be imputed as an act of cowardice save the major and adjutant do it and that tenderly and in the way of their particular duty End of chapter five Chapter six of the private soldier under washington by charles knowles bolton this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter six camp duties the soldier's life was not passed in idleness uniforms and arms require daily attention before the hour for parade and the endless duties connected with cooking obtaining fuel and caring for the camp provided work for all day in camp began at sunrise with the beating of the reveille or earlier when some important movement was to be executed not infrequently the exact moment of dawn was unknown and the tired men were called from their beds in the dark day was said however to have begun when a sentry could see clearly a thousand yards around him and not before to farmers sons unaccustomed to shave frequently to put powder upon their hair or to brush their clothes a constant regard for personal appearance became at once oppressive during the period of late sunrise the men were instructed to shave in the evening that they might be ready for parade in the morning and their canteens were to be filled at night whenever there was reason to expect an early departure from camp or an attack in the opening years of the war many pickets from ignorance of military life or from carelessness brought trouble upon themselves some went back to their quarters to get provisions leaving their posts unprotected others sat down in comfort under trees and as just stated were so negligent that their guns were stolen from their keeping colonel crafts at one time threatened to punish those who persisted in relieving themselves from duty without the presence of a corporal in september seventeen seventy five the following description of military duty appears in a letter written by a southern rifleman at prospect hill on thursday at firing the morning gun we were ordered to ploughed hill where we lay all that day i took my paper and ink along as you once desired i would but found so much to do beside writing that you had only a few lines manufactured in the face of eighteen battering cannon and there was too much noise for writing and the generals appeared in sight i thought it not quite so decent a posture of a soldier thrust my writing materials under an old blanket shouldered my firelock and strutted with all the parade of a careful lad as the autumn of seventeen seventy five wore on the men became accustomed to the routine and were more alert although some failed to remember the proper password or countersign since it was changed every night a single sentinel demanded the countersign only but the sentry next to the guard upon hearing some one approach demanded who goes there and if many were in view he called to the sergeant of the guard who ordered out his men under arms when officers made the grand round the sergeant demanded the parole a watchword not known to the guard which he repeated to his captain if the parole was given correctly he cried grand round pass general ward's selection of the parole and countersign was intended to impress wisdom upon the lonely sentinel who was forced to remember the words if he was unwilling to accept their lesson the parole industry was given with the countersign wealth neatness with gentility inoculation with health in time of danger the parole look out with the countersign sharp must have suggested to the sentinel the path of duty at valley forge there was a chain of sentinels which surrounded the camp at the distance of a mile the men were relieved daily the following entry in sergeant wilde's journal while at warwick rhode island illustrates very well the performance of guard duty at sundown he writes i carried my men to roll call after the rolls were called i mounted guard with sixteen men under my command i marched with my men about two miles towards the point where i left my guard at eleven o'clock i sent a corporal and four men out as a patrolling party which went down to the point and all round the shore they discovered nothing remarkable came in again about one o'clock 
at which time i sent out another party which went the rounds as before and came in about three o'clock at which time i sent another party which went the rounds as usual and came in between four and five o'clock and then i sent another party which patrolled till daylight and then came in with the other corporal and four men from the point i went to the commissaries and got a gill of rum per man after i gave it to them i dismissed them guard service in all kinds of weather and sometimes in places of great danger was not the least trying part of a soldier's routine following as it often did days of great bodily exertion and fatigue he who fell asleep while on duty was punished by twenty lashes on the bare back or more if the enemy was near enough to make the crime a dangerous one the hardships which were endured called occasionally for a recommendation of clemency by a court-martial as for instance in the case of george cook who was tried in seventeen seventy seven for sleeping at his post cook had been ill of a fever for several days and unable to sleep the fresh air of his lonely vigil brought relief and he was found fast asleep standing at his place of duty when a sentinel deserted to the enemy he became the subject of comment old countrymen as the soldiers of foreign birth were called never quite gained the confidence of the army and if a man who was reported as gone over to the enemy was known to be an old countryman the fact was emphasized among the rank and file after the evening roll-call washington preferred natives for sentinels and later he chose from them his bodyguard he insisted that officers should place as sentinels at the outpost those whose characters were thoroughly known he therefore orders that for the future no man shall be appointed to those important stations who is not a native of this country or who has a wife or family in it to whom he is known to be attached washington was driven to prefer americans for officers also when the tide of adventurers from across the sea set in so strongly that it threatened to carry congress with it and drive the native officers into retirement lafayette however he continued to treat with an affection very like that of a father for his son honor and kindness while by no means unknown in war time were not as common in the revolution as the best military standards demand cases might be mentioned which did no credit to royalist or colonist about eight o'clock wrote john clunes in march seventeen seventy nine the rebels sent in a flag of truce to us the british but general powell would not see it and ordered us to fire on them which we did and out of five killed three british treatment of the enemy's outposts was sometimes cruel and uncalled for the following note by lieutenant eld of the coldstream guards describes an experience of his in new jersey i was sent forward with sixty light infantry to attack a rebel picket on the night of the main body of the rebels who were advantageously posted and fortified in a churchyard at a place called paramus the picket was placed at the edge of a wood with a plain of half a mile in the rear i surprised the picket which instantly fled and the most famous chase over the plain ensued we were in at the death of seven i had given orders that my party should not fire but use their bayonets after reading these words it may be well to recall an incident which is recorded in simcoe's journal for it shows that all the inhumanity was not confined to king george's men the rebels continually fired at night on the sentinels a figure was dressed up with a blanket coat and posted in the road by which the enemy would probably advance and fires resembling a picket were placed at the customary distance at midnight the rebels arrived and fired twenty or thirty shot at the effigy the next day an officer happening to come in with a flag of truce he was shown the figure and was made sensible of the inhumanity of firing at a sentinel when nothing farther was intended this was not an isolated case for david howe's diary under date of october twenty eighth seventeen seventy six states that riflemen fired at the sentries of the regulars while the british army lay in sight at or near white plains the danger which a sentry encountered came almost wholly from the sabre and the musket ball but a curious exception recorded by the rev benjamin boardman should be noticed here 
on monday night july thirty first seventeen seventy five the enemy opened fire upon the continentals from their works in roxbury and a cannon-ball came through the air so close to a sentinel that the man was set to whirling like a top he soon fell to the ground but was found to be only slightly injured a month earlier a soldier died from the wind of a ball as it was called camp life was not devoted wholly to drill or picket duty or cooking although idleness was discouraged cutting wood building fires repairing huts cleaning arms waiting upon officers tramping a road through the brush to facilitate the hauling of firewood serving in the grass guard to watch and protect the horses while feeding or making cartridges were useful services which kept the privates out of mischief the construction of earthworks building of whaleboats and other occupations incident to a campaign filled the men's time while in more active service in the expedition to crown point under arnold all hands were employed on occasion in necessary work men were divided into squads some to bake bread some to go in search of game or to spend their time in fishing others to cut timber or mount cannon in south carolina seines were provided for the continental troops that were detailed to fish temporary field works of earth were not in favor in europe a century and more ago they were held to be unmilitary and to foster cowardice but the defenses thrown up at bunker hill in a night proved effective in checking the british advance the firelock behind loose earth weighed heavily against disciplined bravery and the lesson once learned the continentals entered more and more into the construction of such works the lines were first marked on the ground in the angular forms so often shown in illustrated histories covering this period the gabions stakes interwoven with twisted bundles of switches like baskets without bottoms were then set on the lines three or four deep and earth dug up alongside was thrown in fascines bundles of switches about six feet long were then piled up on the outside and inside and were held in place by stakes four feet long driven down through them more fascines were laid on top of the gabions and the whole was then covered with earth and with sod in the space between the foot of the outer slope and the ditch or fosse which was a customary part of the works wooden pickets were frequently planted as was the case at bunker hill in october seventeen seventy five redoubts sometimes had as additional works half-moon structures or transes as at prospect hill farmers accustomed to handle the spade soon grew experienced in this form of labor expert artisans were called upon to make paper for bank notes print proclamations and provide many articles in constant demand these men were usually excused from all other duties and found it to their advantage to exhibit their ability when called upon the dearth of skilled artisans in america is well illustrated by the petition presented to congress in seventeen seventy six in which sundry paper makers prayed that nathan sellers of colonel pascal's battalion might be ordered home to make and prepare moulds washers and utensils for carrying on the paper manufactory the gun-barrel maker the saltpetre maker and he of the nailer's business were in such demand that they could hardly be spared for military service forges had been set up all over the colonies giving employment to iron-workers and gunsmiths the latter were not numerous and a few of these accepted the bait or bribe of high wages in england offered by leading royalists and left the country some of the soldiers were ordered to act as servants to their officers but as this kept many able-bodied men from active service and led to abuses it was discontinued by general orders at valley forge in seventeen seventy eight knowledge of music was also in demand in the boston campaign the drums and fifes of each regiment were regularly instructed by the regimental drum major and fife major and their music stirred the men as martial music does to-day when drums were not to be had french horns were used in the campaign of seventeen seventy nine against the six nations two men were cut down by the indians tomahawks later colonel proctor ordered his musicians in passing the spot to play the touching air of rosslyn castle the soft and moving notes of which cast a hush upon the regiment and awakened pity for their comrades 
the pioneers march was another tune used at the time the memory of one master of the drum should be kept green for he helped to while away many tedious hours during the northern campaign of seventeen seventy six tibbles was his name and as the boatmen sang at their oars they were upon the lake he would give one touch upon the drum which seemed to bring every voice into harmony the soldiers half covered with water as they lay in the boats forgot the loneliness and gloom of the darkening night the music lingered in each man's memory long after the voices and drums were still it is probable that yankee doodle had little or no vogue in the army and the statement by annuary that the lively air was a favorite of favorites the lover's spell the nurse's lullaby is open to serious question at funerals the impressive tune funeral thoughts with its drumbeat at the end of each line was sometimes played washington made use of the artisan in the army whenever it was possible but there were many occasions when capable hands were able to turn a penny after the soldier's day had closed early in the war barter and private labor prevailed among the thrifty to a surprising degree men worked at their trades during the hours between the retreat which beat at sunset and the tattoo which was sounded at eight or nine o'clock the makers of shoes leather breeches or caps earned money and by their work aided to some extent the efforts of the colonies to clothe the army david howe a private at the siege of boston bought and sold cider chestnuts arms and clothing a few lines from his diary will show the busy life that a soldier might lead when not on duty twenty five day january seventeen seventy six i bought seven bushels of chestnuts and gave four posterins per bushel thirty we have sold nuts and cider every day this week thirty one i bought four bushels of apples and gave twelve shillings per bushel for them twenty two february peter gage stayed here last night and i bought three pair of shoes of him at five and six per pair i bought a pair of stocking and gave five and four for them twenty three i sold a pair of shoes for six and eight twenty six i sold my cartridge box for four and six lawful money at the time he carried on this trading he was quartered in one of the buildings at harvard college and did his share of fatigue made cartridges ran ball and even served his turn as cook for the company a curious agreement made between a soldier and a landowner near camp stipulated that the former was to clear a certain tract of land fit for mowing and was to receive a hundred dollars paper currency but if headquarters moved before he had finished the work he was to receive payment for what he had done among the many duties incident to army life the observance of sunday as a day for religious teaching was not forgotten washington himself impressed upon the men under his command the value of christian character and his own example must have aided the chaplains in their difficult labors public prayers were a part of the daily or sunday routine followed by the reading of orders and usually the roll call washington's attitude toward religion in the army was unmistakably set forth when he said to the distinguished character of a patriot it should be our highest glory to add the more distinguished character of a christian and congress ready to promote the same ideals voted september eleventh seventeen seventy seven to import twenty thousand bibles it is curious to notice that all the members from new england were in favor of the measure and all those from the southern states except georgia were recorded as against it although lee of virginia and lawrence of south carolina were with the north a chaplain who it is said prayed and sang with the brigade has described the preparation made for services the music march up and the drummers lay their drums in a very neat style in two rows one above the other it always takes five and often the rows are very long occasionally they make a platform for me to stand upon and raise their drums a number of tears the sermon on sunday usually at eleven was often of a practical nature it referred to the hardships and the duties of a soldier it urged upon him temperance and vigilance cleanliness and honesty in many cases as in those cited herewith the minister altered the text to suit his need 
rev john gano who was attached to clinton's division of the expedition against the six nations in seventeen seventy nine was asked to preach to the troops at cannergery and was requested to dwell a little more on politics than he usually did he preached from the words of moses come go thou with us and we will do thee good for he that seeketh my life seeketh thy life but with us thou shalt be in safeguard rev mr kirtland preached september fifteenth seventeen seventy six to the new jersey troops at fort schuyler from the text he that is not with me is against me and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad upon the fourth of july mr gano took for his text these words this day shall be a memorial unto you throughout your generations but these suggestive sermons did not always attract the men and even when they were present discipline was not maintained as rigidly as would be the case to-day to increase the audience a penalty was once imposed for absence from worship a few hours spent in digging out stumps in a new york woodland proved effective it should be said in defence of the men that the preaching was not always worth a hearing mr bliss said a fellow clergyman preached at cambridge august twenty seventeen seventy five from those words in deuteronomy twenty three nine through fourteen and had he have digested his subject might have done well but attempting to extemporize it was as it was the critic himself however rather outdid mr bliss on the following sunday when as he records he preached the entire day but perhaps he had relays of listeners and not one weary throng as might be inferred rev mr gano was a serviceable preacher when he was informed that many of the soldiers before whom he was to preach on a certain sunday were six and nine months men whose departure from the army would be unfortunate he told his listeners that he could aver of the truth that our lord and saviour approved of all those who had engaged in his service for the whole warfare the rank and file were much amused and those who had engaged for the whole war forced many short-term men by their jesting to re-enlist but the laugh was not always on the minister's side during the winter at valley forge many parsons were at home as the men were too poorly clad to stand in the cold and listen to preaching mr gano was away on leave when he returned to camp he asked a soldier how his commander and the men had fared the soldier replied gravely that they had suffered all winter without hearing the word of god mr gano explained that it was their comfort he had had in mind true said the soldier but it would have been consoling to have had such a good man near us deeply touched mr gano told general van cortland of his encounter van cortland a little later asked to have the soldier pointed out to him and was surprised to see the worst reprobate in the regiment End of chapter 6chapter seven of the private soldier under washington by charles knowles bolton this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seven camp diversions rumors of victory or defeat lent a pleasant excitement to the lives of the rank and file a story of the patriot campaign in canada was passed on together with official dispatches from one post rider to another along the almost impassable river routes of maine over the stony roads of massachusetts and connecticut through the tory settlements of new york and so southward to the congress at philadelphia the dispatches reached their destination unchanged except for a coating of grime and wet but the verbal story grew with each retelling until the last post rider had news to astonish those about the campfires the official news was printed upon handbills which were given out to the men the effect of good tidings is shown in a somewhat famous scene when the stores from the captured ship nancy arrived in the camp near boston there were demonstrations of joy the scene as pictured by colonel moylan is somewhat startling old putt general putnam was mounted on the mortar with a bottle of rum in his hand standing parson to christen while godfather mifflin gave it the name of congress bands of prisoners of war and captive tories passing through the camp awakened patriotic enthusiasm which found expression in shouts from the men 
and the coming of well-known or curious visitors delegates from congress sent to inspect the army or indian chiefs and their followers helped to while away the hours the impression made by such events is illustrated in the record in a soldier's diary that the king of the ingans with five of his nobles to attend him come to headquarters to congratulate with his excellency for many years june fourth the king's birthday had been celebrated in america and when the day was allowed to pass in camp with no festivity and no mirth even the rebel in arms could not but notice this sorry end of a time-honored custom when september twenty second the king's coronation day was referred to as the king's damnation day war had indeed come the great day was the fourth of july commonly called the anniversary of our independency few diaries fail to mention with some detail the usual ceremonies of the occasion the whole army was drawn up under arms at one o'clock with detachments of artillery interspersed and thirteen pieces at the right the celebration began with a discharge of thirteen shots for the states followed by a running fire of musketry and cannon from right to left through the front ranks and then from left to right through the second line repeated three times a speech sometimes followed and then three cheers from the entire army games and an extra allowance of rum closed the day on the british prison ships where all the horrors of starvation suffocation and disease were rife the day brought a speech or a feeble cheer another favorite anniversary was that of the day of burgoyne's surrender which was celebrated by the firing of cannon the throwing of sky rockets into the air skillocats in the air and much merrymaking when the welcome news was received that france had declared for the united states the delighted troops cheered for the king of france the friendly powers of europe and the thirteen states every continental soldier under arrest in washington's army was set at liberty to enjoy the day on more than one occasion a soldier under sentence of death profited by the news that the french king had shown his friendship for the colonies or that a distant battle had been won but the successes of the british bore hard upon the men in the patriot army and sometimes even those in captivity were made to know that their captors had won a victory major griffith williams in command of the detachment of royal artillery with burgoyne ordered that the american prisoners be drawn up in the rear of the british lines to hear the feu de joie given in honor of burgoyne's victories some it is said were stung by the insult while others threw up their caps with the british and were roughly handled by their more loyal comrades the customary holidays were not forgotten christmas and thanksgiving day brought greater liberties and an extra allowance of liquor even st patrick's day produced a noticeable change in camp the irishmen who had been born in america or had settled in the country before the war began were reinforced in some regiments by deserters from the british lines the widow izard a prominent lady in the south honored the name of st patrick in seventeen eighty two by a gift of a gill of spirits to each soldier in general green's army a little later the same army celebrated may day with maypoles and festivities although this was declared to be something extraordinary as indeed it must have been victories and anniversaries brought merriment and noise with their accompaniment of drinking and cursing congress occasionally showed an interest in these celebrations and sent the inevitable present of rum thirty hogsheads were consumed by the gallant survivors of the battle of the brandywine but there were other forms of amusement in camp the men played ball or cards and now and then were allowed a rifle frolic a contest in marksmanship in which the vanquished was bound to treat his more skilful adversary to liquor a form of relaxation not so clearly understood is mentioned by private samuel hawes as an old fudge fairy well my friends during the winter of seventeen seventy five seventy six which was bitterly cold at the north men enjoyed skating on the rivers and ponds and in summer they bathed whenever it was possible they sometimes were able to get away into the country to fish hunt and to gather nuts but these privileges were more often granted to officers 
nothing so depressed the spirits of the soldiers as the inactive life of a camp far removed from the enemy a spice of danger was always welcome to train the raw recruits to be fearless under fire a trifling reward was offered for bringing to headquarters each cannon-ball which was thrown from the enemy's batteries it was found however that the younger men failed to gauge properly the force and weight of a ball that ricocheted slowly along the uneven ground several soldiers in using their feet to bring a ball to a stop were knocked down or crippled this plan had to be given up when the shells from boston fell into the camp at roxbury shrieking like a flock of geese they did more said an observer to exhilarate the spirits of our people than two hundred gallons of our new england rum each shell as soon as it burst was surrounded by a throng of men eager for mementos funerals some one has said must be counted with amusements in a description of uneventful country life the chastisement of wrongdoers may likewise fall into line with the diversions of camp life without great impropriety for the curious modes of punishment in vogue at the time afforded some relaxation if they did not convey the obvious lesson the moral to be taken to heart by the onlookers was weakened by the frequent reprieve of the culprit and this misfortune was only too well understood by the officers one hundred lashes the limit of corporal punishment allowed made little impression upon the spirit of a sullen and wilful transgressor to give a hundred lashes their proper value and importance standing as they did for the penalty next to death itself many serious crimes that needed severe treatment had to be met with inadequate punishment the result as it worked out in practice was that the death penalty was too often imposed and this led to reprieves another unfortunate outcome of the system was the invention of new punishments more or less cruel or savage when officers became exasperated by desertions and mutiny a corporal and two privates were making their escape from the first pennsylvania regiment when they were overtaken and captured after they had been secured a dispute arose some of the captors wished to kill all three on the spot without trial and without authority others counseled delay it was agreed finally to kill one of the three deserters immediately the three luckless fellows drew lots and fate selected the corporal whose head was at once cut off and placed upon a pole this gruesome object was carried into camp by the surviving captives to be placed over the camp gallows as a warning to all if there can be any excuse for such savagery it is to be found in the jeopardy of a great cause by desertions from an already inadequate army washington once wrote our army is shamefully reduced by desertion and except the people in the country can be forced to give information when deserters return to their old neighborhoods we shall be obliged to detach one half of the army to bring back the other in the country about new york many of the inhabitants were from principle or interest trimmers in these uncertain times men when drafted were slow to respond to the call and many after enduring the hardships of camp life for a time returned home to aid a sick or impoverished household they had perhaps begged in vain for an honorable discharge telling as others did throughout the colonies of little ones without food or firewood and when they appeared in town again the neighbors beheld the deserters with tolerance or with half kindly eyes in a letter written at rhinebeck september sixteenth seventeen seventy six john white said i suppose there are not less in this and northeast precinct than thirty deserters who keep in the woods and are supported by their friends ebenezer wilde in his revolutionary journal refers frequently to punishments and it is evident that they interested him by their variety and terrible reality upon one occasion the culprits marched to the place of execution to the strains of the dead march each one with his coffin borne before him the brigade was then paraded with the guilty men in front where they could be seen after this their death sentences were read in a loud voice their graves were dug the coffins were laid beside them and each man was commanded to kneel beside his future resting-place in mother earth while the executioners received their orders to load take aim and 
at this critical moment a messenger appeared with a reprieve which was read aloud this last all-important act in the series was omitted often enough to strain the nerves of every one present by leaving the result in doubt until the last instant the whip was in some cases serviceable although it had little effect upon the hardened offender tied to a tree or post who ground his teeth into a piece of lead and received the stinging blows in silence when the prescribed number of stripes was administered in installments the flesh of the victim had time to become inflamed or to heal partially before the full penalty had been inflicted corporal punishment was carried out by the drummers and fifers under the eyes of the drum major who was required to be present seventy-eight lashes were considered proper for a deserter and thirty-nine for a thief a survival of the mosaic number but there was no invariable rule for writing an infamous letter against colonel brewer a soldier was sentenced to stand in the pillory for an hour where his comrades might witness his humiliation and suffering in less than an hour he fainted mr wilde our faithful chronicler describes another scene a soldier marching from the guard-house to the gallows with a halter about his neck and from there running the gauntlet naked through the brigade usually the brigade was drawn up in two lines to form a narrow lane sometimes half a mile in length through which the culprit had to pass to receive the lashing from switches held by the men if he was unpopular he fared ill if he was liked by his comrades and was fleet of foot he suffered but little to make the gauntlet a serious penalty a soldier was ordered to point his bayonet at the guilty man's breast and back slowly down between the lines so that the progress could not be too rapid for adequate punishment this ingenious device served to lay the victim on his bed for several days at ticonderoga a band of mutinous sailors ran a species of maritime gauntlet they were sentenced to receive seventy-eight lashes each the criminals to be whipped from vessel to vessel receiving a part of their punishment on board of each a more cruel punishment than most of those just mentioned was that of riding the wooden horse which so injured the man that some officers refused to make use of it but there were penalties that afforded real amusement as in the case of bowen sentenced to wear a clog chained at his leg three days or in that of griffith guilty of selling major carnes's cordage to wear a clog four days with his coat turned wrong side outwards End of chapter seven chapter eight of the private soldier under washington by charles knowles bolton this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eight hospitals and prison ships the scylla and charybdis of the soldier were the hospitals of his own army and the prison ships of the enemy perhaps the knowledge of this made the life in camp and on the road more endurable than it would otherwise have been to see the dawn over a hilltop drove out the depression that comes with the night and to stand in the full radiance of the warm sun at noonday baffled malaria and stayed the march of disease but the sun and the stars never came to the sufferer upon his sick-bed nor often to the half-crazed half-naked creature in his marine prison pen the health of the men in camp was not forgotten although the means of checking contagion and alleviating pain were inadequate and many of the household remedies of to-day were then still to be discovered in continued bad weather a half gill of rum was issued to each of the men and they were cautioned against drinking new cider and also the water of streams forded during the heat of the day the air of the huts and tents was purified by burning the powder of a blank musket cartridge daily or by lighting pitch or tar the hospitals were treated in the same manner in many of the hospitals where there were few beds or blankets and no medicine or nurses the service was not much more than the presence of a doctor until death came colonel wayne writing to general gates in december seventeen seventy six said our hospital or rather house of carnage beggars all description and shocks humanity to visit 
the cause is obvious no medicine or regimen on the ground suitable for the sick no beds or straw to lay on no covering to keep them warm other than their own thin wretched clothing at this time the death came so rapidly that the living grew weary of digging graves in the frozen earth a scene something diverting though of a tragic nature as lieutenant elmer puts it occurred in consequence two graves had been dug with much labor by men of the new jersey line for their dead but when they having gone for the bodies came back prepared to bury their comrades they found that some pennsylvanians had come upon the open graves and finding no one near deposited their own dead there and covered them with earth a hot dispute ensued and the new jersey troops succeeded in digging up the other bodies which were thrown under a heap of brush and stones good doctors and faithful ministers were rarely wanting in the camps and they went about where men lay tossing from side to side on sacks of straw or grass and did much to comfort the sufferers my heart is grieved wrote rev ami r robbins as i visit the poor soldiers such distress and miserable accommodations one very sick youth from massachusetts asked me to save him if possible said he was not fit to die i cannot die do sir pray for me will you not send for my mother if she were here to nurse me i could get well oh my mother how i wish i could see her she was opposed to my enlisting i am now very sorry do let her know i am sorry mr robbins was a devoted chaplain who had to nerve himself constantly to bear the foul air that injured his health and the tales of sorrow that burdened his heart he believed that the war was waged in a just cause and when the men of whole congregations went out to battle he felt that ministers should be ready to nurse their sick and bury their dead at saratoga an officer from each regiment was appointed weekly to visit every day the men from his own corps scattered through the hospitals but this care availed little when medicine and surgery were not always represented in camp by able physicians and antisepsis and anaesthetics were unknown cleanliness in conducting difficult operations was not insisted upon as it is to-day and the wounds made by large round bullets moulded by hand needed the very best of treatment putrefaction and pain ran riot in the emaciated bodies of the soldiers and many who survived never regained their health the kind of medicine recommended by a doctor's wife may prove of interest from a soldier's description of his sick friend's condition she thought the trouble might be gravels in the kidney as the diarist wrote the name and she ordered a quart of gin and a tea-dish of mustard seed and a handful of horseradish roots steep them together and take a glass of that every morning the gallant fellow submitted to this new affliction and happily was able to report that he found benefit by it the truth is that much of the illness came from a longing to be at home from hunger and from cold referring to the first of these causes of army sickness general schuyler once said of all the specifics ever invented there is none so efficacious as a discharge for as soon as their faces turn homeward nine out of ten are cured for the other tenth just referred to the remedy used at valley forge mutton and grog proved to be as useful as anything to aid in resisting the germs of disease that everywhere threatened the camp with pestilence in the quebec expedition when exposure and hunger had prepared the way a fourth or third of the men in some regiments died of smallpox from the records of the general hospital at sunbury pennsylvania for seventeen seventy seven to eighty it appears that about four-tenths of the patients not counting the convalescents were the wounded about three-tenths suffered from diarrhoea or dysentery and one-tenth from rheumatism to state this in another form lack of proper food and shelter crippled the army as much as did the fire of the enemy the number of cases treated however was not large enough to give very accurate statistics the sick suffered from crowding and from an insufficient supply of medical stores those on the upper floors of hospitals had little or no ventilation and at bethlehem four or five invalids one by one occupied the unchanged straw until death came like an angel of mercy 
it is perhaps not very strange that communities did not want army hospitals and the arrival of open wagons in which lay groaning soldiers wet with rain and snow was the signal for vigorous protests from the populace as soon as the patients were able to walk they were told that there was too little food to make a longer stay desired and they were sent out penniless and weak to walk the country roads begging from house to house this in itself was an objection to the presence of a hospital in a neighbourhood in such a state of poverty the support of a minister seemed an expense that could be avoided and few were found in the hospitals at new windsor west point barracks morristown albany philadelphia fishkill yellow springs williamsburg and trenton where many were often needed sickness and inadequate hospital facilities had a very direct effect upon the conduct of the war every haggard soldier who returned to the village of his birth was a silent force decreasing enlistments and increasing the amount of bounty to be wrung from the taxpayers this was particularly true at the south in the summer of seventeen seventy six seventy seven the commissariat was the great arbiter of events during the revolution insufficient food caused disease and desertion crippling the army until washington was forced to keep to a fabian policy that irritated those who were unfamiliar with the obstacles in his path if the continental soldier in the hospital of his countrymen had reason for discontent he might well believe that he would fare even less happily in the hands of the british who rarely were able to make adequate provision for their prisoners after the retreat from new york in seventeen seventy six the churches of the town were crowded with starving americans some with dull eyes and parched speechless lips sat upright and sucked bits of leather or wood the last act of a reason almost extinct and others lay upon the bodies of their comrades gnawing bones and begging their keepers to kill them while the helpless creatures were in this condition the sentries were said to have annoyed them needlessly the description of prison life in philadelphia during the british occupation is too ghastly to be credible in all its details dr albigence waldo of washington's army who has been quoted frequently in these pages complained that the enemy did not knock their prisoners in the head or burn them with torches or flay them alive or dismember them as savages do but they starved them slowly in a large and prosperous city one of these unhappy men driven to the last extreme of hunger is said to have gnawed his own fingers up to the first joint from the hand before he expired others ate the mortar and stone which they chipped from their prison walls while some were found with bits of wood and clay in their mouths which in their death agonies they had sucked to find nourishment one must keep in mind the fact that nearly all contemporary authorities were influenced by the bitter spirit of the times to overcolor their pictures of the suffering which came with war there were frequent complaints of cruel treatment of prisoners from the commanders of both armies british and american and each side hoped to profit by the publicity given to harrowing details at about the time americans were enduring privation in new york in the autumn of seventeen seventy six an event occurred at the north which proves that the british could show a magnanimity that might become dangerous to the cause of independence arnold's brave attempts to check the advance of sir guy carleton on lake champlain had ended in a furious naval fight and arnold's retreat the american sailors taken by carleton were treated like friends by the commander and his men news came to gates that they had been sent down the lake in boats to his camp and colonel trumbull was accordingly instructed to meet them trumbull soon found that the men were enthusiastic over their reception by carleton and loudly praised the generosity of the british in alarm he hastened back to tell gates that the men would work mischief with their tales of a bountiful enemy if allowed to mingle with the soldiers of the army trumbull's view was approved and the surviving captives were at once ordered southward to skanesboro on the way to their homes the prison ships were perhaps less oppressive in summer than the city places of confinement but at best they were unclean strictly guarded and insufficiently supplied with food and medicine 
many deaths occurred daily and on board the jersey popularly known as hell the morning salutation of the officer was rebels turn out your dead the horrors of those days have been pictured so often that it is unnecessary to re-sketch the sickening details the living and the dead lay together in the stifling holds of the ships until the time came to bury the latter these were put beneath the sand on the beach near by and in the next severe storm they were washed back into the sea to float for days in the hot sun near the portholes of the prison ships in warm weather one man was allowed on deck each night and the prisoners crowded about the grating at the hatchway to get a breath of air and to be ready when their turn came to go out the sentinels thrust their bayonets through the grating in sport and sometimes it is said killed one of their prisoners lest these scenes in the lives of the captive soldiers seem too incredible it may be well to add the experiences of a man of letters who was famous in his day and is not altogether forgotten in our time philip freneau the poet of the revolution freneau spent some time in the prison ship scorpion which lay in the north river in seventeen eighty the conditions there were so terrible according to the poet that any plan of escape however likely to fail was tried while every attempt increased the brutality of the hessian jailers who were held responsible for their detention when a number of men had rushed upon the sentries disarmed them boarded a vessel near by and escaped the guards in their chagrin vented their anger upon the remaining prisoners by firing into the hatchways freneau soon came down with a fever and was transferred to the hospital ship hunter some convalescents on board waited one day the coming of the doctor when he had gone below they slipped into his boat as it lay alongside and made a successful escape the doctor was annoyed and after that regardless of the sick and dying who had no part in the plan he passed by the hunter at a distance on his rounds an appeal for blisters too loud to be ignored one day caused him to rest on his oars he looked up at the eager faces suggested pleasantly that the sufferers plaster their backs with tar and rode on to the ill-famed jersey in a characteristic letter written in seventeen eighty from passy dr franklin told mr hartley a peace-loving englishman that congress had investigated these barbarities and had instructed him to prepare a school-book to be illustrated by thirty-five good engravings each one to picture a horrid fact that would impress the youthful posterity in america with the enormity of british malice and wickedness while patriot soldiers were suffering in city prisons and on the water many captives were beginning years of confinement in old mill prison near plymouth england and at forton jail outside portsmouth usually they fared reasonably well although forty days in a black hole with half rations and no resting place but the damp stones seems a severe penalty for attempting to escape or for commenting unfavorably on the quality of the meat isolated cases of barbarity were condemned in london newspapers and the frequent visits of mr hartley m p and rev thomas wren of portsmouth to american prisoners kept punishment within proper bounds the people of london in december seventeen seventy seven subscribed three thousand eight hundred and fifteen pounds seventeen shillings six pence to provide clothing and other necessities a weekly allowance of two shillings from the american envoys was invaluable so long as it could be maintained but in seventeen seventy eight this was unavoidably reduced the fare occasioned comparatively little protest although franklin in his letters complains that those who were not sold into service under the african or east india companies were cheated by public prison contractors in seventeen eighty he provided sixpence per week for each of the four hundred or more americans and as his countrymen were not permitted an equal allowance with the french and spanish prisoners being rebels the money was very welcome in the following year english generals sent home great numbers of captives and franklin's efforts to effect an exchange were thwarted by the caprice of british officials many remained captive in england for as long a period as four years and when the general act for an exchange was passed in the winter of seventeen eighty two 
there were more than a thousand americans held for high treason in england and ireland the prisoners in some cases were allowed to make trinkets which they sold to visitors and they occasionally succeeded in sending letters to their friends the news which was allowed to filter in was usually bad news such as the final defeat of the continentals or the death of washington in considering the british treatment of american prisoners in america some allowances must be made the british army managed to cling to the sea coast of the continent but could not provide a suitable place in which to confine able-bodied captives who were ready at any time to effect an escape or to cooperate with an attempt made by the rebels to rescue them the length of the war also bore hard upon the british soldiers three thousand miles from home and increased an irritation which perhaps received its first impulse from the regulars natural contempt for the volunteer in rebellion against the king there were two ways of relief open to the prisoner in british hands one at the sacrifice of his honour another by the injury of his own cause he could enlist under the crown stifle his conscience and take his chance of capture as a deserter or he could if fortunate be exchanged for the redcoat in an american prison few of the better soldiers of native birth were willing thus to obtain freedom by service under the king and the exchange of privates for privates operated so strongly to the advantage of the british forces that conference after conference could find no mutually satisfactory basis of agreement and the prison ships kept their burden these prisoners who had all the claims of humanity upon their side were for the most part too enfeebled to be fit for further service and some were levies called into the field for short periods when exchanged therefore the sick would have to be discharged by washington and many of the able-bodied men having reached the end of their terms of enlistment would go home the british captives on the other hand were better nourished and less subject to disease as they were in the regular army they would remain in america or be sent to do garrison duty in the place of troops that were being trained for service in the colonies so it happened in this way that when congress was hard pressed to keep in the field a force not too conspicuously inferior to the enemy an exchange of prisoners was clearly a misfortune for every reason except that of humanity as an exchange was a most practical means of giving comfort to the enemy the privates who endured year after year the hardships of prison and prison ship instead of going free were serving their country as truly as if they had been in the field end of chapter eight chapter nine of the private soldier under washington by charles knowles bolton this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nine the army in motion sprightly sally wister arrayed in her prettiest clothes watched washington's army as it moved down the skipek road from germantown after the retiring redcoats she enjoyed the drumming fifing and rattling of wagons and the soldiers no doubt found pleasure in looking at her in the bright sun and bracing air they made a gallant array given the best of health and favorable roads they could march well for a number of miles but much of the time bad roads and poor shoes retarded their progress while broken sleep wet clothing or insufficient covering at night sapped the vitality of the best constitutions and made laggards of them all in rainy weather the baggage train the artillery or the cattle if they by any chance went before the men cut the road to pieces and made it next to impossible to march in order a day's march in the canada expedition was frequently as little as ten miles while in sullivan's campaign against the indians the day's journey varied from less than ten to about twenty miles although it at times rose to forty miles in the twenty-four hours major norris in his diary calls attention to the most extraordinary march of his men from tioga to easton in pennsylvania a distance of a hundred and fifty six miles in eight days nineteen miles a day over a mountainous and rough wilderness with artillery and baggage 
better progress could be made by infantry when unencumbered the maryland companies of riflemen marched nearly five hundred and fifty miles from fredericktown now frederick city to cambridge in twenty-two days or almost twenty-five miles a day general green's army in the southern expedition covered two thousand six hundred and twenty miles from april sixteenth seventeen eighty to april nineteenth seventeen eighty one morristown to camden or about seven miles a day including battles and camping men were often ordered at the retreat or sunset drumbeat to be ready to march at sunrise at times the brigades paraded at sunrise grounded arms breakfast and if the weather was favorable struck tents and marched by eight or ten o'clock but occasionally the men fell into line at sunrise were counted off and marched from four to eight miles before breakfast in the heat of the summer the general was beat frequently as early as two or three o'clock to warn the men that they were to march and the troop an hour later for them to fall into line it was necessary to halt now and then for the artillery and stores to overtake the troops or for the men to rest wash their clothes and clean their arms when the long line was again in motion sometimes in single file as happened in sullivan's expedition officers musicians rank and file artillery pack-horses cattle and camp followers the spectacle was inspiring as the two thousand pack-horses in this expedition alone covered six miles it is not difficult to understand that the farmer on the lonely frontier might eat his breakfast as the first strains of music came down the road do his morning work and sit down to dinner as the artillery came in sight labor in the fields and return to his supper as the rear-guard in search of stragglers passed on the way through the indian country was often picturesque and strange leading over high barren mountains from which the wide plains like another world could be seen below then down into wooded ravines dark and damp with vapor the men noticed the different trees the pine the elm the hemlock the walnut and turned over the soil with their bayonets there was much to see as sullivan marched through the country about the present bradford pennsylvania and elmira new york great stretches of fine english grass spear grass or clover the broad fields of maize watermelons and pompions burning villages and smouldering cornfields were on every hand but such an expedition necessary though it may have been gave no satisfaction to men who sought worthy adversaries and it demoralized those of weaker character there is said a surgeon who understood the suffering that followed the success of their army something so cruel in destroying the habitations of any people however mean they may be being their all that i might say the prospect hurts my feelings the soldiers passed the mangled bodies of two dogs hung high on poles to appease the evil spirit that terrorized the red man and denied him victory the spirit had not stopped the invaders who came upon the indian campfires and villages so rapidly that much was left behind in the haste of flight near a hut they found a child of three weak and hungry but playing with a chicken while a milk cow left by the not wholly heartless squaw grazed quietly within sight ready to furnish nourishment a feeble old woman left by the indians to the mercies of the white men received from general clinton a keg of port and some biscuit although no officer of rank less than a field officer had tasted such luxuries for some days with this act of kindness must stand barbarities that would be incredible if noticed by a single writer only lieutenant barton in his journal under the date august thirty seventeen seventy nine says at the request of major piatt i sent out a small party to look for some of the dead indians returned without finding them toward morning they found them and skinned two of them from their hips down for bootlegs one pair for the major the other for myself after reading of this pleasant enterprise which reached its successful consummation at a place near cayuga creek it is not impossible to understand thomas ansbury's observation that the americans loved to kill there was however a brighter side to the war 
at seneca castle in a fertile country the indians were supposed to be gathered in force as soon as the troops approached the woods and fields in the neighborhood detachments were sent to the right and left and posted just out of sight so that at a signal they could converge hem in the savages and take the works by storm having carefully arranged the details the general set out to inspect the lines before ordering an advance as he rode he beheld each soldier with as many pompions or melons as his bayonet could hold and each military shirt bulging with beans and corn in his wrath he exclaimed you damned unmilitary set of rascals what are you going to storm a town with pompions some two weeks before the above event took place the diarist whose account has been followed afforded amusement in a different way in attempting to catch a doe which had ventured into camp he was knocked down and trod upon by the frightened creature in making her escape deer bears and wild turkeys were not uncommon near tunkahannock pennsylvania but as the men were not allowed to fire in camp nor break ranks when marching animals had little to fear pike chub gar and suckers were caught in the streams near where the army encamped the southern campaigns brought other experiences pretty young women gathered at the roadside says observant william feltman their faces almost entirely hidden by linen to protect them from the burning sun and around them as if in contrast a retinue of blacks without a stitch of clothing to cover them a sight much more unpleasant but possibly equally characteristic at the time was that of a negro's head stuck on a sapling on one side of the road and his right hand tied to a sapling on the opposite side the negro had been hanged and cut in pieces for killing a white man the same writer an officer but probably not more quick to receive impressions in a new country than some of the rank and file comments on the lack of pines in north carolina and virginia the infrequent meadows and the flourishing plantations of the germans and the quakers his eye noticed the gray owl the red bird flocks of green parakeets and some alligators and his ear detected sweet singing frogs if these wonders of nature were observed by the private soldier he was less inclined to record them in his diary after the weary day's march and the meagre supper which followed a tale of hardship and adventure was more suited to his laborious pen james melvin a private in arnold's unsuccessful expedition against quebec in seventeen seventy five has described the ascent of the kennebec into the heart of the main forest and the journey down the chaudiere to the waters of the st lawrence death and desertion reduced the force of over a thousand men to some seven hundred worn out by marches through hideous woods over mountains and through the marshy banks of rivers where the men sank into moss and mud striving to haul the camp baggage through ravines and intervales on october twenty eighth they waded knee-deep among alders and so forth the greatest part of the way one man fainted in the water with fatigue and cold but was helped along we had to wade into the water and chop down trees fetch the wood out of the water after dark to make a fire to dry ourselves however at last we got a fire and after eating a mouthful of pork laid ourselves down to sleep round the fire the water surrounding us close to our heads if it had rained hard it would have overflown the place we were in another member of the expedition has described the events of the next day we had to wade waist-deep through swamps and rivers breaking ice before us here we wandered round all day and came at night to the same place which we left in the morning where we found a small dry spot and made a fire and we were obliged to stand up all night in order to dry ourselves and keep from freezing three days later the same writer observed uh, we travelled all day very briskly and at night encamped in a miserable situation here we killed a dog and we made a very great feast without bread or salt we having been four days without any provisions and we slept that night a little better satisfied our distress was so great that dollars were offered for bits of bread as big as the palm of one's hand the following day staggering for want of food they came upon the cattle sent back by colonel arnold who had gone on in advance of the party 
the campfire was the soldier's best friend on the march by it he dried his clothes and cooked his scanty meal it protected him from the cold in northern countries and even from prowling wild beasts by its light he cleaned his gun or wrote a few words in his diary for the family to read upon his return while he slept it gave light to those who bridged the stream over which the army would pass at sunrise but if the campfire was a protection when the air at night was chilled by bleak winds and wet fog there was no remedy for a tropical sun at noon after the battle of monmouth the army of washington lay at english town for two days and set out on july first for spotwood the weather was so warm that nearly a third of the men were unable to continue upon their feet until evening and many had to be conveyed in wagons in virginia in seventeen eighty one the troops were ordered to cut their coats shorter for their greater ease in marching under the hot sun the heat was somewhat easier to bear than the cold in the winter those who had for shoes strips of rawhide which were passed under the soles and bound to the ankles left marks of blood on the snow as they marched even those who had good shoes sometimes kept them on for so long a time that the leather had to be cut from their swollen feet the companionship of many men tramping together was apt to keep fear from their minds but in passing through dark and lonely valleys at night the dread of attack added to the gloom they sometimes marched in single file each man with his cartridge box on his knapsack to keep it dry in wading deep streams and when on a dark indian trail each man with his hand on the frock of the man before him to guide his steps the rain beating ceaselessly upon the leaves overhead and dripping into the pools below the wind sighing and the wet branches creaking in the wind then a flash of lightning that revealed a line of weary muddy plodding men shut out of sight in another instant by the black of night and lost in the rumble and roar of thunder that was what a writer had seen when he wrote that fighting happens seldom but fatigue hunger cold and heat are constantly varying the soldier's distress at such a time panic was ready to break forth at any moment on one occasion in virginia in may seventeen eighty one the lightning struck near a moving column of troops and stampeded the horses the militia thought the enemy were upon them and threw down their arms in the muddy road where they were and rushed headlong into the woods the rear guard which was accustomed to follow the army to stop stragglers and deserters sometimes performed a like duty over the cattle and to march in the dark behind a thousand animals along a narrow muddy road already cut to pieces by heavy artillery was a test of patriotism a passage in the journal of elijah fisher describes simply and well the hardships which the defensive policy of washington with its quick marches and countermarches brought upon the private soldier about dark it did begin to storm the wind being in the northeast and the artillery went before and cut up the roads and the snow come about our shows shoes and then set in to rain and with all which made it very tedious at twelve at night we come into a wood and had order to build ourselves shelters to break off the storm and make ourselves as comfortable as we could but just as we got a shelter built and got a good fire and dried some of our clothes and begun to have things a little comfortable though but poor at the best there came orders to march and leave all we had taken so much pains for there were brighter days and pleasant marches not to be left altogether from the soldier's calendar a pretty story has been preserved by an aged pensioner who was once in the commander-in-chief's lifeguard it will serve to brighten the picture of the army in motion the men were marching slowly along one day with washington at their head where the road skirted a pond a number of boys were engaged in throwing or jerking stones to make them skim across the face of the water halt came the command then washington said now boys i will show you how to jerk a stone he performed the feat successfully smiled quietly and ordered his men to march forward that is the story to be credited or not as one wills 
when the soldiers endured every species of privation in camp and on the march it is not strange that they treated the property of people near them somewhat cavalierly as the continentals came in sight patriotic farmers drove their cattle into the hills and put their hens out of reach to have their fellow-countrymen quartered upon them was distressing from the desolation that marked their sojourn permission to take property was seldom granted to private soldiers and washington made every effort to appease the countryside in an order against plundering issued november third seventeen seventy six an exception was made in favor of straw and in time of great dampness of grain in the sheaf to keep the men from the ground at night the custom of allowing scouting parties in time of great fatigue to take what they needed by plunder was greatly abused the chevalier de la luzerne relates that in the winter of seventeen seventy nine eighty the soldiers grew desperate under half rations and took to marauding and pillage this was stopped by washington but as famine set in he ordered foraging expeditions house to house visitations for clothing blankets shoes and every kind of food that could be spared by non-combatants under these trials of war the soldiery and the inhabitants seemed to the french writer very submissive needless cruelty the general abhorred and he strove constantly to suppress the baser element which was as terrible a scourge as the enemy petty plunder was looked upon by the soldiers as ragging is to-day by college boys a form of stealing that should be known by a more gentle name a soldier for example threw a stone at some geese in a pond killed one and stowed it away carefully in the roomy confines of his drum when the irate farmer overtook the company the drumhead had been replaced and his search for the goose was unsuccessful on another occasion the branches of a quaker's orchard furnished some thirty or forty fowls which were sent on ahead before daybreak and later in the morning were cooked with onions potatoes and carrots when cattle grazed on the hillside above the camp and the kettle was empty a condition and not a theory confronted the cook in such a case a colonel was known not to disdain a quarter of beef left quietly at night beneath the flap of his tent or if a soldier when meat was scarce wished to visit a friend whom he had not seen for many years and he was excused from roll-call by the captain he might by chance find his friend in the act of cutting up a steer it would be such a pleasure to return with meat for the company days of privation justified theft in the eyes of many of the rank and file upon one occasion in seventeen seventy nine the troops marched by the body of a soldier hung for inexcusable treatment of the people a comrade slapped the dead man on the thigh and said well jack you are the best off of any of us it won't come to your turn to be hanged again this ten years in the north sympathizers with the king suffered less at the hands of passing soldiers than in the south and yet it was not uncommon for a plain-spoken tory a ministerial tool to get a coat of tar and feathers especially during the months when companies from the central colonies were on their way to join the army about boston the british regulars in boston as early as march seventeen seventy five had inflicted like punishment on a country fellow who as was said had been making preparation for rebellion by buying a gun from a redcoat tories were not always subjected to tar and feathers in may seventeen seventy six at a drinking frolic as it was called a tory forgot his caution and drank to the king's success he was immediately dragged off to the guard who knocked the end out of a hogshead and forced him to dance yankee doodle on it until next day in the south there was no neutral ground possible for the country people when the king's troops were in possession of the land the tories drove the rebel sympathizers into the mountains killing husbands on their doorsteps and shooting children before their helpless mothers when lincoln or gates or green came down from the north the tide of blood swept back upon the tories many families in georgia and elsewhere on this account lived in the mountains and subsisted by hunting efforts were made however to protect the royalists and general green in his orders prohibited the soldiery from insulting any of the inhabitants with the odious epithets of tory or any other indecent language it being ungenerous unmanly and unsoldierlike 
in truth the poor tories found little comfort from either army a new york fugitive declared that the british spoke of the enemy as rebels but the tories they called damned traitors and scoundrels in many towns they were forced to drill with their neighbors and when drafted were expected to pay well for substitutes in massachusetts the selectmen or overseers of the poor were empowered to bind out their children with those of the town paupers the tory while in exile in england suffered in spirit if he escaped physical pain he heard his native land referred to in pompous terms as our plantations and as franklin so delightfully drew the picture he saw every englishman jostle himself into the throne with the king that he might talk of our subjects in the colonies his friends in the rebel army were said to possess every bad quality the depraved heart can be cursed with before he could analyze his thoughts he found himself rejoicing that news of a rebel victory diminished the conceit of the insufferable islanders about him and it may be said that the tory in a foreign land never entirely forgot that his friends and his kinsmen were fighting for the soil that he loved Kerwin has shown us these feelings in the story of his own exile and governor hutchinson wished to return to lie at last in the soil of his native land the practice of plundering tories was not so much to be regretted as that of robbing the friends of congress under the specious pretense that they were secretly loyal to the crown this habit annoyed washington frequently and he complained in january seventeen seventy seven to the governor of new jersey that the militia officers had been known to lead their men in these infamous expeditions but robbery was a misfortune less serious than the treatment received by real tories the council of bennington in january seventeen seventy eight gave out the following order let the overseer of the tories detach ten of them with proper officers to take the charge and march them in two distinct files from this place through the green mountains for breaking a path through the snow let each man be provided with three days provisions let them march and tread the snow in said road of suitable width for a sleigh and span of horses order them to return marching in the same manner with all convenient speed let them march at six o'clock to-morrow morning after the battle of bennington the tories were the sport of the soldiery they were tied together in pairs and attached by the traces to horses which were in some cases driven by negroes the same spirit is evident in the remark of a soldier made after the battle one tory with his left eye shut out was led by me mounted on a horse who had also lost his left eye it seems to me cruel now it did not then if the thought and action of the time appear unworthy of men fighting for liberty it is well to stand for a moment as they did with the contemptuous redcoat and his prison ship toward the rising sun and the treacherous redskin with his scalping knife toward the western sun that was no time for over refinement the british army while marching through an enemy's country found the indian allies unmanageable they demanded permission to pillage and torture as their reward for service perhaps with this in mind general fraser told his prisoners that if they attempted to escape they would receive no quarter but would be at the mercy of indians to be hunted down and scalped probably fraser hardly expected to be forced to allow so barbarous a punishment but burgoyne himself found the greatest difficulty in holding the savage allies to humane methods of warfare and regard for prisoners thatcher has described the art of scalping with a knife he writes they make a circular cut from the forehead quite round just above the ears then taking hold of the skin with their teeth they tear off the whole hairy scalp in an instant with wonderful dexterity this operation very serious and painful was not necessarily fatal and a number of soldiers survived the scalping knife as they did battles and lived into the next century after the fight at freeman's farm the indians are said to have spent the next morning in scalping the dead and wounded a german officer makes the statement and when taken with other evidence it does not seem improbable scalps were worth about eight dollars each the price varying somewhat according to agreement 
general carleton has been accused of paying for scalps and american prisoners of more or less veracity as well as indians testified to this as a fact while it can scarcely be credited as consistent with carleton's known character or as probable treatment of white people by their own race one should not forget that the colonists had for a century and more set a dangerous example a bounty on scalps of hostile indians was the prize toward which a frontier sentinel looked to augment his income as an instance among many the vote of the new hampshire house of representatives may seventeen forty six may be given the tariff was fixed at seventy pounds for the scalp of each male indian over twelve who was at war with the province and of thirty seven pounds and ten shillings for scalps of women and of children under twelve years of age had the indians joined the american army they would have scalped the british regulars who took their chances of death in any form but they threw in their lot with the royal cause and so fell upon old men helpless women and children more often than they did upon the continentals these were the unfortunate conditions of the struggle there is little to relieve these pictures of barbarity and yet the following sprightly narrative by ethan allen is not without its humorous aspect he says the officer i capitulated with then directed me and my party to advance towards him which was done i handed him my sword and in half a minute after a savage part of whose head was shaved being almost naked and painted with feathers intermixed with the hair of the other side of his head came running to me with an incredible swiftness malice death murder and the wrath of devils and damned spirits are the emblems of his countenance and in less than twelve feet of me presented his firelock at the instant of his present i twitched the officer to whom i gave my sword between me and the savage but he flew round with great fury trying to single me out to shoot me without killing the officer but by this time i was nearly as nimble as he keeping the officer in such a position that his danger was my defence but in less than half a minute i was attacked by just such another imp of hell then i made the officer fly around with incredible velocity for a few seconds of time when i perceived a canadian who had lost one eye as appeared afterwards taking my part against the savages and in an instant an irishman came to my assistance with a fixed bayonet and drove away the fiends swearing by jesus he would kill them End of chapter nine chapter ten of the private soldier under washington by charles knowles bolton this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter ten the private himself the revolutionary rank and file when their uniforms were fresh were a picture for the eye with their cocked hats decked with sprigs of green their hair white with flour their fringed hunting shirts and their leather or brown duck breeches many were boys some at the opening of the war were under sixteen with the virtues and vices of youth they were eager for adventure and every strange sight and custom made its impress upon them in the quebec expedition the wayside crosses and the chapel interiors rich in colour interested the soldiers in the march against the six nations indian superstitions and habits of life were described in almost every diary and in the southern colonies the peculiarity of slavery attracted the attention of the men from the north through travel and contact with the world there was an opportunity for the earnest soldier of good principles to widen his horizon and broaden his sympathies the yankee the dutchman and the southerner came to know more of one another some of those who could write kept diaries these journals have many references to the weird and the unusual and they show a rough humour in this respect they reflect the taste of the time privates even those who rose to the commissioned ranks spelled many words by sound when this spelling indicates peculiarities in pronunciation it gives some impression of the language of the campfire david howe of methuen was a private of the massachusetts line with all the sharpness and oddities that characterize a new england farmer in his diary there is a consistency of error which amounts to a dialect he always wrote whelped for whipped 
and the same tendency is evident in the use of splet meaning split stimped for stent and a pecking up for picking up a new englander therefore seems to have pronounced short i as though it had the sounds of an e in get he reversed the sounds in words which properly gave short e saying ridgment for regiment git for get went instead of went lit for let etc private john white also a new englander used a for e and i so persistently that the nasal twang is very evident as in his use of sartain for certain prance for prince lev for leave sands for sins and wall for well privates howe and fisher treated r much as it is treated to-day in new england they wrote salatoga for saratoga dogstar for dorchester sorloin for sirloin yesterday for yesterday and after instead of after but where no r occurs or where it is not emphasized they made it prominent by writing for tieg in place of fatigue cartridges for cartridges always arms for arms water for water and carcel for castle other pronunciations as valuable for valuable bargon for bargain jain for join and jest for just are not uncommon to-day privateer was a stumbling block that had to be overcome in those exciting days and how bravely wrote privatesters and privatesteres to convey his meaning phrases now unused appear in diaries as lit of meaning met for to go to boston and says money an allowance for vegetables the impression which proper names made upon the mind of a private soldier may be inferred from his use of hushing hessians dullerway delaware vinkern lincoln and marcus delafayette or delafayette it should not be forgotten however that on the whole the english language as spoken by the more educated colonist was purer than the speech of englishmen whose lives were confined to such counties as devon and yorkshire the soldiers had their own designations for their enemies and friends the british were commonly called lobsters and new recruits were it is said spoken of as the long-faced people keeping a diary in all kinds of weather with no table to write upon poor quills and thick ink and hands numb with cold or stiff from guard duty was an achievement which must command respect as the scratchy pen was driven slowly across the fibrous paper in the flickering glare of the camp-fire the writer with brows puckered to concentrate his thoughts and keep from his mind a babble of voices put down much that was instructive and amusing to one the sunday text was worthy of note to another the current price of shoes or the details of an execution for crime mr howe was careful to record deaths and after each name a heavy black line completed the entry as a proper mark of mourning sam hawes of wrentham was particular about the appearance of his pages and when he made a blot in his journal he added oh you nasty sloven how your book looks elijah fisher referred to above studied diligently when opportunity offered his diary in february seventeen eighty states i stays with mr wallace and follows my writing and ciphering the same as i had done the evening before for every evening from six of the o'clock till nine i used to follow my study under date of october seventeenth this quaint note appears in his book i agreed with sergeant sam whipples to stay one month with him after my time was out and so do his duty and he was to larn me to write and cipher and what other larnin would be easy it is pleasant to know that this training proved of value the next year when the absence of the captain one lieutenant and both sergeants for a time threw much of the care of the company upon his shoulders the retreat from bunker hill was mortifying to the defeated participants officers as well as men who found fault with the insufficient powder and reinforcements the americans were on a peninsula the approach to which could be commanded by a british man-of-war they did not realize that longer occupation might have induced the british to cut off their line of escape and starve them into surrender 
a quick defeat for which the enemy paid heavily both in lives and in prestige did more for america than possession of the defences on the hill for another night could possibly have done until a soldier acquires sufficient education to fit him for an officer's commission he was not thrown with men who heard the current news at headquarters his horizon therefore was limited and a battle far-reaching in its influence upon events meant no more to him than a chance encounter a private at the battle of long island ignorant of the critical state of the patriot cause on that memorable occasion states the facts very quietly twenty seven our army on long island have been engaged in battle with the enemy and killed and taken a good many on both sides twenty nine this night our army on long island all left it and brought all their baggage to new york the same soldier thus described the battle of trenton twenty six this morning at four o'clock we set off with our field pieces marched eight miles to trenton while we were attacked by a number of Husing hessians and we took a thousand of them besides killed some then we marched back and got to the river at night and got over all the hutching twenty eight this day we have been washing our things the writer declined to heed the general's entreaty to remain in service for six weeks longer drew his wages and says money and marched for home missing by two days the famous engagement at princeton the soldier's inability to comprehend the state of affairs at critical periods may account often for a seeming lack of patriotism as in the case just cited but on the other hand his ignorance kept his heart light colonel cadwallader less than a fortnight before the battle of trenton closed a letter to robert morris by saying that he had been led into a complaining tone by the damned gloomy countenance seen wherever i go except among the soldiers when given a chance the privates did their share of thinking in the execution of large plans this was a disadvantage since the machine-like corps could better be reckoned with than the body of individuals in seventeen seventy six a skirmish took place between a party of straggling soldiers and some hessians who held a rocky eminence between the termination of mount washington and king's bridge two pennsylvania privates advanced up the hill and opened fire they were soon joined by a few recruits who soon silenced the hessian guns seeing this a detachment of about fifty of the enemy set off to aid their outposts by this time the little group of volunteers numbered twenty or more without officers to consult they talked over the matter among themselves and decided to form into three divisions one to attack the rocky defences of the enemy and two to circle the position in order to fall upon it in the rear or to meet the advancing reinforcements the manoeuvre was entirely successful for the outpost retreated to avoid falling into the trap and the americans took and held the rocky stronghold until darkness came on in any large number of men some there are who will study and think for themselves ready or preparing to influence and lead but too many are indolent and heedless when mrs esther reed in seventeen eighty offered to washington the three hundred thousand six hundred and thirty four paper dollars which the ladies of philadelphia had raised for the army she proposed to turn this sum into specie and present to each soldier two hard dollars the commander replied that he preferred a shirt for each man as money would induce drinking and discord the payment of wages often led to disorder as intimated by a private at cambridge in his remark peace with our enemy but disturbance enough with rum for our men got money yesterday rum was an article of daily consumption and its evil effects must have balanced whatever of good it did it was drunk to the health and success of the ladies to celebrate victories to encourage enlisting by fatigue parties to counteract the strain of hard work in bad weather and even more liberally when there was no object in view when taken early in the morning unmixed with water it impaired the health of the men and in long marches the hard drinker was most apt to suffer at the siege of boston sam hawes a private experienced the not unusual effects of merry-making we turned out he says and went to the alarm post and it was very cold and we came home and there was a high go of drinking brandy and several of the company were taken not well pretty soon after 
david howe tells the story of two men at cambridge who fell to bantering one another as to who could drink the most this led to excessive drinking from which one of the men died in an hour or two upon another occasion john coleman drank three pints of cider at one draught a feat that excited comment james mcdaniel was so eager for rum that he forged an order to obtain it to check excessive drinking spirits were allowed to be sold at one place only within the limits of each brigade and sutlers were sometimes enjoined from selling after the retreat had been sounded at sunset hard cider was much used as it still is in country towns in place of distilled liquors the story is told of a private then not over sixteen years of age who was taunted in camp with being homesick until he lost his patience and attempted to thrash his persecutor at first unsuccessful he called for quarter but receiving none he fought desperately and worsted his antagonist the affair became the talk of the company and reached the ears of the captain the two men boys they really were soon came up before their comrades to receive whatever public punishment the captain thought meet amid silence he looked sternly at the culprits angular and tall poorly clad by their province and as poorly fed youthful and perhaps a little frightened he allowed his eyes to rest on their bronzed faces for he knew them well then in the hush he said you are ordered for punishment to drink together a mug of cider after the first instant's astonishment the laughter that followed was proof that the captain knew the failings of his men sensuality is not often mentioned in the diaries or letters of the soldiers although references are not wanting stealing however was not uncommon lieutenant burton lost his cotton shirt by a bold thief and a soldier for stealing a cheese was whipped thirty lashes samuel hawes has related how in the camp near boston in october seventeen seventy five a rifleman was whipped thirty-nine stripes for stealing and afterwards he was drummed out of the camps if the infernal regions had been opened and cain and judas and sam hawes had been present there could not have been a bigger uproar swearing was a habit which washington tried in vain to check the coarse language of many of the men shocked him as it did others a clergyman referring to the new york troops who were with arnold in seventeen seventy six remarked that it would be a dreadful hell to live with such creatures forever but to suppose that there was no strong religious leaven in the army would be a mistake corporal farnsworth of groton found a young soldier with whom he could converse freely on spiritual things and said with a grateful heart i find god has a remnant in this depraved and degenerated and gloomy time while every army has its men of low principles they weigh little in the winning or losing of campaigns if the great majority are efficient and brave the americans as a pioneer people were accustomed to danger and they were familiar with firearms men might be relegated to the awkward squad to learn manners but the polish would cover a stout heart sir william johnson wrote that the british ministry must not look upon the americans as cowards who would not fight while ambury commented on their courage and obstinacy which had already astonished the officers under burgoyne a continental soldier who had been at bunker hill remarked that he would to god that his people had as good courage in the spiritual warfare as they had in the temporal not to multiply statements the testimony of a tory of new york may be given as final evidence of reasonable courage shown by the american troops commenting on the fighting in new jersey in june seventeen eighty he remarked of the rebels they were mostly militia and stood and fought better than ever before no doubt the militia accomplished all that could be fairly expected of men who did not make war a profession they were subject to panic but fought well when they knew the land and the purpose of the commander and were also sure that no trap awaited them a saying in the army that gates loved the militia because they would never bring him under fire is a commentary on the private as well as the general but men who were familiar with militia knew what to expect dr john witherspoon of new jersey speaking in congress in seventeen seventy six reminded the members that at the battle of preston militia ran like sheep 
at falkirk in seventeen forty six the speaker himself saw troops behave fifty times worse than the americans had behaved at long island washington said of his own troops in seventeen seventy six place them behind a parapet a breastwork stone wall or anything that will afford them shelter and from their knowledge of a firelock they will give a good account of their enemy but i am as well convinced as if i had seen it that they will not march boldly up to a work nor stand exposed in a plain a few months later he wrote being fully persuaded that it would be presumption to draw out our young troops into open ground against their superiors both in number and discipline i have never spared the spade and pickaxe i confess i have not found that readiness to defend even strong posts at all hazards which is necessary to derive the greatest benefits from them washington wrote these words after the battle of long island five days later lord percy wrote the moment the rebels fired our men rushed on them with their bayonets and never gave them time to load again i think i may venture to assert that they will never again stand before us in the field whether this was due to cowardice or inexperience he did not assert but kerwin the loyalist held to the view that the inability of untrained troops to face regulars in the open was no proof of lack of bravery it has been said that washington's strength as a commander lay in his readiness to learn a lesson from experience he discovered very soon the value of earthworks and persisted in their use without regard to expressions of disapproval from european officers in braddock's campaign his advice to seek protection behind trees had met with disfavor and now lee spoke slightingly of hastily made defences and others considered them destructive of manliness and courage john adams represented a certain public impatience when he wrote the practice we have hitherto been in of ditching round about our enemies will not always do we must learn to use other weapons than the pick and the spade the motives which controlled enlistment are not easily defined patriotism adventure money glory all have their weight in determining human action a frenchman who spent a year in america reported that all the recruits were mercenaries led by a few patriotic officers so general a charge needs no serious answer but it may be stated as self-evident that the poorer the soldier of any rank the more dependent he will be upon the compensation which he receives for his services the rank and file were no doubt more in need of money than their officers when it did not come even in the form of paper they mutinied their officers fortunately could resign the charge could not have been true in seventeen seventy five later as it became evident that farmers with children to be supported were unable to remain in the army their places were taken by young men who made war a profession and expected its rewards the heads of families soon found that service in the army meant starvation for those at home through the demands of producers following the example set by avaricious retailers the price of necessities rose beyond the reach of the soldiers wives said a student of the times at this rate what will become of thousands of people who depended on their absent friends in the army for a subsistence those who having no home ties could go into the army for a small bounty and moderate wages were carried along by the tide what the married men required the young men seeing their opportunity were led to demand claude blanchard visited the army under washington at peekskill in seventeen eighty one to his eye the soldiers marched well but handled their arms badly there were he relates some fine-looking men also many who were small and thin and even some children twelve or thirteen years old they have no uniforms and in general are badly clad it is not difficult to understand the physical condition of men who had clung to army life through its few bright days and its many days of privation when one recalls the winter at valley forge it was there that james thatcher while walking with washington among the soldiers huts heard voices echoing through the open crevices between the logs no pay no clothes no provisions no rum and the few who flitted from hut to hut were covered only with dirty and ragged blankets the men were supposed to make as good an appearance on guard and on parade as was possible 
they were ordered to have their beards close shaved their clothes and shoes cleaned and their faces and hands washed when an event of importance occurred the men powdered their hair south carolina troops in seventeen seventy six were instructed to have their hair properly trimmed up and tied for cap wearing but without side locks pay for the barbers was obtained by stoppages from the wages of the men in our day powder and long hair seem more suited to a ballroom than a battle decimated army the convenience and cleanliness of short hair did not apparently receive the serious attention of commanding officers sullivan's army three thousand strong returned from the indian country in tatters with the remaining parts of their garments hanging in streamers behind them yet they had sprigs of evergreen in their caps and their heads were as white as a wagon-load of flour could make them the incongruity of the spectacle convulsed the officers and moved the chaplain to forget his gravity the language of the private was not that of a mercenary wright of the new jersey line frequently referred in his journal to the philistines meaning the enemy and commented upon the diabolical rage of the parliamentary tools on bunker hill then held by the british another private a massachusetts man referred to the wicked enemy and a less restrained writer to the butchers belonging to the tyrant of great britain private mcmurton of maryland referred to general gage during the siege of boston as that crocodile and second pharaoh namely tom gage corporal farnsworth a very religious man spoke of the burning of charleston by that infernal villain thomas gage and to the possession of boston by our unnatural enemies plain speaking and independence of thought were characteristic of a people less bound by class distinctions and therefore less accustomed to obey than those of equal educational and property qualifications in the old world these traits made their impress upon events said governor trumbull the pulse of a new england man beats high for liberty his engagement in the service he thinks purely voluntary therefore in his estimation when the time of his enlistment was out he thinks himself not holden without further engagement this feeling accounts for a serious reduction of the army besieging boston in the winter of seventeen seventy five seventy six as company after company broke camp and marched away the troops hissed showing unmistakably that many disapproved of the action personal loyalty sometimes found its expression in hand-to-hand -hand encounters between the ardent patriots in the army and those whose zeal was open to question a new englander it is said felt no hesitation when meeting a half-hearted nova scotia volunteer popularly called a holy ghoster in knocking him down on the spot without pretext or preliminary explanation the following picture of the private soldier singing as he suffered is by a surgeon at valley forge he studied the details day by day the humorous and pathetic the light and the shade see the poor soldier when in health with what cheerfulness he meets his foes and encounters every hardship if barefoot he labors through the mud and cold with a song in his mouth extolling war and washington if his food be bad he eats it notwithstanding with seeming content blesses god for a good stomach and whistles it into digestion but hark ye patience a moment there comes a soldier his bare feet are seen through his worn shoes his legs nearly naked from the tattered remains of an only pair of stockings his breeches not sufficient to cover his nakedness his shirt hanging in strings his hair dishevelled his face meagre his whole appearance pictures a person forsaken and discouraged he comes and cries with an air of wretchedness and despair i am sick my feet lame my legs are sore my body covered with this tormenting itch my clothes are worn out my constitution is broken my former activity is exhausted by fatigue hunger and cold i fail fast i shall soon be no more and all the reward i shall get will be poor will is dead there was another side to the war picture enthusiasm and excitement enabled men bred to a city life to endure exposure to the dead of winter that under ordinary circumstances must have proved fatal 
dr benjamin rush has called attention to the apparent effect of the victory at trenton in seventeen seventy six upon some fifteen hundred philadelphia militia during a period of five weeks or more these men unaccustomed to hardship slept in barns and upon the bare ground with a record of only two cases of sickness and one of death the plain living and comparatively regular hours of camp life are said to have saved some men from consumption and other diseases while the change of environment from the too frequent irritation and pettiness of village life delivered nervous persons from their own misfortunes and freshened their minds two questions arise in connection with the men of the revolution how many served against great britain and what became of the survivors after the war had closed general knox in a report to congress attempted to answer the first of these but his tables are hopelessly confusing since they are based upon the number of men to be enlisted rather than upon the number of those who engaged themselves and upon records of the years of their service rather than upon the number of men performing this service by the roughest kind of calculation the total number of men who served as continentals or as militiamen during any part of the eight years of the war must have been far in excess of two hundred and thirty two thousand the usual estimate based upon knox's tables many of these men died of wounds or disease and many more returned to their homes broken in health and without suitable occupation the names of officers and privates who received pensions have been recorded by the government from time to time mention should be made first of a list giving one thousand seven hundred and thirty pensioners whose names were on the rolls june one eighteen thirteen again of another giving about sixteen thousand names in eighteen twenty of a third three thick volumes a report from the secretary of war in obedience to resolves of the senate of june fifth and thirtieth eighteen thirty four and march three eighteen thirty five and of a fourth list a thin volume which appeared in eighteen forty portraits of several aged pensioners may be seen in e b hilliard's work on the last men of the revolution and one of ralph farnham called the last survivor of the battle of bunker hill will be found in c w clarence's biographical sketch of him samuel downing a private of the new hampshire line was the last surviving revolutionary pensioner under the general acts which placed all state and national pensioners and finally all men who had served nine months on the rolls he died february eighteen eighteen sixty nine at the age of one hundred and seven the last survivor placed on the rolls by special act of congress was daniel f bakeman of cataraugus county new york who died april fifth eighteen sixty nine at the age of one hundred and nine as late as june thirty eighteen ninety nine four widows of soldiers of the war appeared on the pension rolls in the preceding pages officers have been quoted as authorities on the rank and file it would hardly do to quote seriously the opinions which a private at the age of one hundred and two held in regard to his superiors but a line from downey's observations on each of the great names of the war may nevertheless not be out of place of arnold a bloody fellow he was he didn't care for nothing he'd ride right in it was come on boys twasn't go boys there wasn't any waste timber in him he was a stern-looking man but kind to his soldiers they didn't treat him right but he ought to have been true of gates gates was an old granny looking fellow of washington oh but you never got a smile out of him he was a nice man we loved him they'd sell their lives for him alexander milliner another aged pensioner said of arnold arnold was a smart man they didn't sarve him quite straight of washington he was a good man a beautiful man he was always pleasant never changed countenance but wore the same in defeat and retreat as in victory pension legislation relating to the revolution was summarized by the commissioner in his report of october nineteen eighteen fifty seven the first general act march eighteen 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 was for the benefit of officers and men in need of assistance who had served in the continental army or navy to the close of the war or for nine consecutive months and allowed to privates eight dollars a month the act of may fifteen eighteen twenty eight 
gave to privates in the continental line who had served to the close of the war the amount of their full pay whether in need of help or not the act of june seventh eighteen thirty two gave to all persons who had done any military service in the revolutionary war for six months a fourth of full pay with increase varying according to the terms of service up to two years these acts were followed by what was known as the widow's acts the total expenditure to the year eighteen fifty seven exceeded sixty million dollars or less than one-half the yearly pension appropriation now made on account of later wars to state the comparison in another way the civil war the chief source of the pension roll in forty years has cost in pensions forty times what the revolutionary war cost in eighty years this is a commentary on the growth of the country from seventeen eighty three to eighteen sixty five in population territory and wealth and perhaps also on an increasing willingness to accept public aid in the years immediately following the close of the war the veterans too often were obliged to depend wholly or in part upon friends or children for support they went from town to town telling their stories at the village inn or by the fireside to the boys and girls of that time who have passed them on to our own day the hardest misfortunes came in the summer of seventeen eighty three elijah fisher's experiences are recorded in his journal and as he had served for several years as a private soldier they may be taken as a fair picture of the trials of the less fortunate enlisted men he left the old jarsey prison ship april ninth seventeen eighty three and landed in new york city that night he slept at the city hall tavern where he was well treated and provided with a shirt he continues the tenth ah leaves mr franceps and so goes about the city to see it and went into numbers of their shops and would say your servant gentlefolks i wish you much joy with the news of peace i hope it will be a long and lasting one some of them would be very well pleased with it and would wish me the same and others would be on the other hand and said that their circumferences poor at present but now they hoped they would be better i said what then do you think of us poor prisoners that have neither money nor friends and have been long absent from our homes then some of them would pity us and would give us something some half a dollar some a quarter some less some nothing but frowns the next afternoon fisher sailed for boston he arrived in due time and the story proceeds the fourteenth i leaves mr brimmer's at the plains i goes through brookline and into old cambridge from there to the ten hills and then to charleston and then cross the ferry into boston but there was so many that come from the army and from sea that had no homes that would work for little or nothing but their victuals that i could not find any employment so stays in boston till the seventeenth in the meanwhile one day after i had been inquiring and had been on board several of their vessels but could get into no business neither by sea nor land the sixteenth i come down by the market and sits down all alone almost discouraged and begun to think over how that i had been in the army what ill success i had met with there and also how i was so wronged by them i worked for at home and lost all last winter and now that i could not get into any business and no home which you may well think how i felt but then come into my mind that there were thousands in worse circumstances than i was and having food and raiment i ought to be content and that i had nothing to reflect on myself and i resolved to do my endeavour and leave the event to providence and after that i felt as contented as need to be with this quaint narrative of the troubles that fell to the lot of the revolutionary veteran and the consolation that were his also this record of the private soldier closes he was a humble instrument in a great cause he profited by an opportunity that does not come in every generation whether france or washington or the patriot army contributed most to bring about the peace of paris in seventeen eighty three is of little moment france and washington long ago had their due it has been the purpose of these pages to give the private soldier under washington whatever share in the victory was his by right of the danger privation and toil 
that he endured. End of chapter 10. End of The Private Soldier Under Washington by Charles Knowles Bolton.